let me know. Okay. Good evening. This is Chairwoman Makita Scott. I now, I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, March 23rd, 2021. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. Mr. Mahomza, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are currently closed to the public in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair, in consultation with the vice chair, and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and review those portions of the meeting. As a result, tonight's as a result, tonight's hybrid Board of Education meeting is being held both virtually and in person by board members and broadcasted through Microsoft Teams Live and BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Fios Channel 34, excuse me, and Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names while making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as requesting discussion on an agenda item. Okay. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the March 23rd agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Good evening, I'm not aware of any additions or changes to tonight's agenda. Thank you. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? We don't need a roll call vote. Oh, we don't, thank you. I apologize, the um, agenda is approved. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with Council to obtain legal advice. Nine, conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters <clears throat> that relate to the negotiations. Nine, conduct collective bargaining negotiations, excuse me, or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. And 15, discuss cybersecurity. If the public body determines that public discussion would constitute a risk to one, security assessments or deployments relating to information resources, technology, two, network security information, or three, deployments or implementation of security personnel, critical infrastructure, or security devices. The minutes of the closed session and informal summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Ms. Lowry. Thank you. Good evening, Chairwoman Scott, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, recognition of deceased. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits 
D1 through D3. So, so moved. Back. Second past your. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Gover? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Mr. Offerman? Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the report on board policies. Members of the board the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept this committee's approved proposed changes to the following board policies. I'll go through those. Policy 6002, selection of instructional materials. Policy 8221, chair, vice chair duties. Policy 8311, meetings. Policy 8314, meetings agenda. Policy 8360, ethics code. A a applicability and definitions, policy 8361, ethics code, statement of purpose and policy, policy 8362, ethics code, gifts, policy 8363, ethics code, conflict of interest, prohibited conduct, policy 8364, ethics code, financial disclosure statements, policy 8365, Ethics Code Lobbying, Policy 8366, Ethics Code Review Panel, and Policy 8601, Use of Social Media. These recommendations are presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit E. So do I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the Board's Policy and Review Committee? Okay, so I don't, so there's no motion to accept the recommendation of the Policy Review Committee? Mm, okay. So okay. moved. Was that a motion? Yes. Uh, who was that? Josh. Mr. Mahumza. Okay, so no second is needed. Since the recommendation comes from the committee, um, is there any discussion? Looks like we have Dr. Hager. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I'd like to discuss the policies 8311, 8314, and 8601 separately. Do I have to make a motion to separate those out to have three separate discussions, or is that just something I can ask for? Um, we can separate those out. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, 8311, which is meetings. 8314, which is meetings agenda and 8601, which is the um, new social media policy. So we're separating out three. Oh, she, Dr. Hager put it there. We're separating out one, two, and actually, yeah, three, four, and 12. Thank you. Okay, um, and I just wanted to check, do we need a motion to separate those out or we can just separate them out for discussion? Okay, so then would we then um, approve the others and then separate these out? Yes, sir. Mr. Bersades, could you advise on that? Yes, you can vote on the others now. Okay. So that, um, yes, was there a question? Yes, this is Ms. Hen. Yes, Ms. Hen. I'd also like to ask that we separate 8221. Yeah. 8221. And that is... And that is the policy chair, vice chair duties. Correct. Thank you. 
Okay, so do I have a motion to approve um, the other policies other than the ones that we are separating out? We're separating out 8221, 8311, 8314, and 8601. Can I have the microwave? Yeah, do I have a motion to approve the, um, the other policies outside of those, and then we can discuss the others? So moved, Josh. Thank you, and no second is needed since it comes from the committee. Okay. And then do we need to take a vote on those, on that, Mr. Mercedes? Yes, yes. Madam Chair. Okay. If we could, Ms. Gover, do a roll call vote. Ms. Roth? Hey, Rod. <clears throat> could someone please mute their microphone? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? I'm sorry? We can't hear you, Ms. Mack. I'm sorry. Yes. Mr. McBillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Mr. Offerman? Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. So that carries. So um, now um, we can have discussion on the others, and I believe it was Dr. Hager first, and then um, Ms. Hatton, if I have that correct. Yeah, so, so I was hoping to, sit, to talk about each one individually. So should we start with AD? Which one do you want, which one do you want to start with? Um, it's up to you, either one. You can, okay. If you like, you could go in order. Um, okay, uh, so I, th I had 8311 <clears throat> listed first. Um, and so I just, um, I had concern, my only main concern was that I believe that this um, policy was meant to address part of the um, inspector general's concern about interruptions during board, mem board meetings in general. And I guess um, when we come back to in-person meetings, um, this is only meant to address hybrid meetings. And so um, will this sufficiently address the inspector general's concern? Um, I can actually uh, answer that. That was, um, that policy was in regards to doing remote meetings and um, how we would govern our decorum and um, ourselves remotely. The inspector general's concern, um, and that the, both of the letters are in um, board docs, was around behavior of social media as, as well as decorum. So it would, it would address some of that, but not all of it. Okay. Okay, I don't know if others have questions about 8311. Any other questions on 8311? Yes, Madam Chair, one comment. Yes, Ms. Hen. So 8311 has been updated, as um, Dr. Hager said, with special rules for virtual meetings, including empowering the chair to disconnect or mute any board member, causing, quote, undue interference with the meeting. My concern is that undue interference is broad and it's not defined in the policy and it allows for censor censorship of 11 board members by one board member. I'd like to see the committee um, clarify and expand upon that language with specific instances where the chair would have that authority. I'd also like to get advice from legal in terms of um, this policy change infringing on board members' freedom of speech. I'm sorry, you said you'd like to get legal advice on this policy, 8311, infringing on freedom of speech? I'd like this um, policy to go back to the committee so that legal can advise on the changes infringing upon board members' freedom of speech. Okay, because this was reviewed in committee, um, and Ms. Causey um, was on the committee, and she still is, as well as um, uh, Ms. Rell. Um, when it, when it was first discussed and and reviewed, so. sorry, I am no longer on and that my, committee. No, you're not. But you were when this um, first came up. It was prior to my chairwomanship, actually, when this um, policy was drafted. Yes, and my concern <clears throat> is that interfe undue interference with the meeting is not defined and is subject to um, interpretation. 
by the chair with this authority. I'd like to see the policy expanded with more specific definitions around that. Around so undue interference. To move forward. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Hen. And I'm going in order. It looks like um, Mr. Mahomza and then Ms. Causey. Thank you. Um, I guess I have a question and a comment. Uh, my first, um, my question would, uh, would be towards Ms. Howie. Um, I remember, and I, I don't remember exactly what part from the Open Meetings Act training that I took earlier in my term, but it mentioned um, the board has the power to remove the public uh, if they're causing interference with the meeting. Um, did that also m um, mention board members who were interrupting or causing interference with the meeting? So actually, Mr. Mahamza, the undue interference language comes directly from Robert's Rules of Order and specifically from the appendix concerning rules for electronic meetings. Thank you. Yeah, um, my only comment on this policy is going to be short. Um, it's not uh, the insinuation by the board member that the chair is going to act unilaterally um, to remove any board member. Just uh, first of all, if the chair. I'm sorry. Could someone please I mute? Yeah, like I like what occurred last meeting where we learned that the chair, the ruling of the chair can obviously be overturned by the vote of the board. So it's not like the chair is acting unilater unilaterally without any checks on their power. And in terms of free speech, th this policy only addresses um, interference with the meeting. It doesn't um, reference speech. I mean, you're free to speak when it's time. It's your time to speak. But interference with the meeting is more like sounds in the background. Um, if a person would have your credentials there, uh, then it's warranted to, to remove them from the meeting. But it doesn't address anything about speech. Thank you. That's my only comment. Thank you, Mr. Mahumsa. It looks like, um, and I'm trying to go in order, uh, Ms. Colsey and then Ms. Rowe and then Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would support a revisit of this policy, um, given the comments about clarifying and having uh, board counsel specifically um, perhaps provide clarification in that clause. Um, the board counsel was not at the um, policy review committee meeting. Um, so if there was a review by uh, counsel at a later time, I, I'm not aware of that. So I would support um, moving it back to the PRC. Um, the other thing that I um, would support is really the, and we've seen this from comments from constituents and also in terms of comparing with other meetings that are virtual, um, the consistent use of turning the cameras on so that our constituents and our staff, and the superintendent are aware that the board members are engaged paying attention, they are focused 100% on the very important topics that we're discussing relating to our students and our staff and our families. So um, I would like uh, consideration of that and um, I'm not gonna make a motion at this time, but if other board members wanna comment on that or um, if um, Mr. Brusades uh, would like to comment on that. So Ms. Causey, I would direct your attention to page four, video display, which does address uh, the speaker at the moment, the board member who is speaking, having to have his or her video displayed at the time. Yes, so that's the only time. It's um, in my last reading of it, it's not when the roll call, it's not uh, when voting occurs. Um, you're what? correct, ma'am. That was not discussed in committee, uh, nor was there a request at that time. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Next is Ms. Rowe. I agree that there are certain aspects of this, uh, which Ms. Hen pointed out, that are vague and require definitions. And those definitions need to be articulated in the policy because right now it is subject to interpretation what constitutes interference with meeting 
and um, I move to move this back, this policy back to policy review committee to further deliberate on those definitions. Second, Hen. Could you put that motion in the um, in the chat, please? Numbers 8311, right? Yes. Is it in the check? Is it in the chat yet? Uh, hang on, I'm writing it. Mm -hmm. Okay, there you go. <clears throat> okay, so Ms. Rowe has made a motion to move policy 83 and 11 back to PRC to deliberate on the definitions associated with the policy. That was moved and seconded by Ms. Moved by Ms. Rowe, seconded by Ms. Hinn. Uh, Ms. Gover, could we take a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe. Madam Chair, may I comment before we vote? I thought all the comments, I thought we'd well debated this. There's additional comments? I had indicated I'd like to comment in the chat after Ms. Rowe. Uh, yes, please go ahead. In response to Mr. Mahamza's comment that um, I was inferring that Madam Chair would act unilaterally. That was not an inference. It was a statement of what's in the policy. The chair makes the decision. The chair mutes or disconnects members. That is my concern. It does not say that the chair deliberates with the board to vote on muting or disconnecting the member um, who's causing undue interference. So it is a decision exclusively made by the chair, and I think it warrants um, clarification and specific instances when the chair may use this authority. To mute or disconnect a member from a meeting is a serious consequence. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mahomes, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, just Mr. Mercedes, yes or no. Didn't last meeting you didn't didn't you say last meeting that a ruling by the chair can be overturned by the board by a vote? Yes, a ruling by the chair can be appealed uh, and it is subject to a majority vote. So no, so like like I said, Miss uh, Han, a chair by a ruling by a chair is not unilateral. The board can check the powers of the chair. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Madam Chair, may I respond? follow up? We oh okay. We really need to vote on this. Um, please. Thank you. Once muted or disconnected, which is implied, would be instantaneously. The consequence has already been delivered. So once the board could appeal the decision, but the board member has already been muted or disconnected. Thank you. And Ms. Rowe? So, yeah, I, I agree that the way the policy is written, if a chair can just mute or disconnect a board member, that prevents the board member from even raising a point of order or having the ruling of the chair. And there is no ruling if the chair has the authority to just do it. So I believe that the policy um, needs to go back to PRC to more clearly articulate what constitutes disruption and under what circumstances the chair may simply mute or disconnect members from the meeting. Thank you. Ms. Gover, may we do a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahonza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is nine. Okay, so 80 through 11 will go back to committee. Um, the next one, we were going in order 
Um, Dr. Hager, is, which policy would you like to? Um, so I had 8314 written down next, um, which has to do with budget setting, or budget setting, um, agenda setting. Okay. That's correct. Um, so I, I read the analysis and I looked at the policies that were linked in the analysis from Anne Arundel County and Frederick County and Hartford County. Prince George's uh, link did not work. It was to an internal drive of some sort. And I didn't see in, those, in that analysis the, the changes that were made specific to our policy. And so, um, and then I listened to the meeting as well, and it was still unclear to me as to, as to why these changes were specifically being made, which are that once the agenda is set, it is set in stone unless someone would like to make a change, they have to submit it 24 hours ahead of time, and then it needs a unanimous vote. And I just would also like to say that today we didn't get the, some, some of the materials for this meeting until noon, after 12 o'clock. And so I think it just makes it really hard to uh, make a policy that we can't change the agenda um, except for 24 hours ahead of time, which allows us to not make time sensitive decisions, especially if we're not guaranteed to have all the information we need for a given meeting. So I just had some concerns about those changes. Any other discussion? Looks like there's a comment from Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Dr. Hager articulated my concerns, which are the same two aspects of the policy change. One, that it requires written notice 24 hours in advance to make a motion to amend the agenda. I agree that we are often not receiving information in a timely enough fashion to be able to prepare motions 24 hours in advance. My second concern is that it requires unanimous consent of the full board to amend the agenda. Um, this allows for one member through a dissenting vote to control the ag all agendas. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Next, uh, Ms. Rell. Yes, I completely object to section BC, which requires unanimous vote to amend the agenda. And um, I will not ever vote in favor of this policy that contains that. I also completely object to uh, giving motions 24 hours in advance. I think that that is unduly restrictive. It's one thing to supply motions in writing during the meeting so they can be read. But there, it, there is nothing in Robert's Rules of Order that sets a precedent for having to supply motions 24 hours in advance. So I object to both of those things. So I will not be voting in favor of this policy. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do not agree with the change to make it a unanimous vote to change the agenda. Uh, there are um, multiple board members, if not the majority of board members, that uh, utilized the ability to add agenda items at the beginning of the meeting. And I would say that many of those times it was very important and timely to do so. Um, and I would say that as chair, I was not given notice in advance uh, on most of those occasions. Um, but with the will of the board being expressed, then I did facilitate and coordinate the effort of adding those agenda items that were approved. I would also point out that at just the uh, last meeting, there was an agenda item requested by the building and contracts chair at the request of the superintendent to add an emergency contract. So there are any number of situations where the agenda may need to be uh, adjusted uh, at the beginning of the meeting. There have also been many times where over the years, and again, I've been on the board since 2015, where items were removed. Uh, there may have been a personnel decision where we were hoping to have all of the paperwork done, uh, but then we weren't, and so we could not make an administrative appointment. So we had to uh, remove that at the request of the superintendent. So um, I don't support that at all. And in fact, uh, the history of that is when I first came on the board, that was the case, and it was completely used as a limiting factor for very important topics to be uh, discussed. Um, and uh, the other board member that was on prior with me uh, will recall that there was a number of times that transportation could not be discussed, curriculum issues could not be discussed, uh, safety issues related to the children could not be discussed because they were not put on, uh, put on the agenda by the chair. And in the open meeting, it took a unanimous vote and that was not achieved. And uh, Vice Chair Hen and I, when uh, we were chair and vice chair in January of 2019, 
we made the recommendation to the board and I appreciate the board's support at that time to allow this rule to be more inclusive okay. and allow board members to have uh, collaboration. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Colsey. And um, I would just say um, that this is the comparison that you made to the previous board um, with this unanimous consent was drafted or put in there because there have been agenda items that have been added at the last minute that were not well vetted. Staff was not prepared to present. And um, I think that that's, that does us as a board a disservice and um, especially when items could have been brought up beforehand. So I feel unanimous consent means that if we're going to have our meetings elongated by various items, regardless of what they are, then we all need to agree to that. Also, something I've implemented as um, prior to even becoming chair was where we do agenda setting at the end of every meeting. So everyone has an opportunity. So we do hear what um, people want. So it's not like it, this is constricting and we don't have other options or other ways to um, add to the agenda. Also, motions in 24 hours. I want to speak to that as well, because I'm sure the public has heard me ask several times and board members have heard me ask for motions to come and to be put into the chat so they can be properly stated. And that still is not happening. Um, I've asked, I've spoken about it. So that was why in the spirit of that, so that we could actually state something proper and not just have it at the last minute and misstate it and restate it and be incorrect in the statement. It's some um, organization and some formality to it. So that is where that came from. So now it looks like we had um, Ms. Mack next. Yes, um, I just wanted to um, support what Ms. Rose said. I, I do not support the motions 24 hours in advance. Um, the motion I made at the last meeting to add um, payroll issues was made because I was waiting till the last minute to see if based on the thousands of emails that we received that would have been um, added to the agenda. And when it was not, I used a motion to add it to the agenda because it's very important. And I believe we as board members need the flexibility to add to the agenda when things that are happening to our students, our teachers are not on the agenda to be discussed. So I would not support this, uh, these changes at all. Thank you. And looks like we have oh. Ms. Hen. Thank you. I move to refer policy 8314 back to the policy review committee to address the concerns mentioned by board members. Second, Second Causey. Call. Okay, thank you. And I will ask once again, if you could put that in the chat so that motion can be properly stated. Okay, thank, thank you for that, Ms. Hen. So Ms. Hen, uh, move that policy 8314 be referred back to committee to address the concerns raised by board members. And that was seconded by Ms. Causey, I believe? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, and so it looks like there's a comment um, from Ms. Pastor and then Dr. Hager. Thank you. My first, the first part of my comment goes to the 24 hours. Uh, I worry that we have so many motions that really impact, and of late I've seen some of those, um, that really impact on the system. They impact, could impact fiscally. They impact in terms of um, the educational um, um, process in the system, and I think that all members should have the opportunity to do their homework, to be able to uh, ask questions, uh, to share information or to glean information before coming to a meeting and having something that is going to have long-term impact on the system 
uh, put before us where we uh, do have to make a decision. Now, I realize that what goes with that is that sometimes there are motions that arise that are certainly simpler in um, nature. But I do believe that either there has to be something about the language, but 24 hours, to me, is on the outside, that some of the motions that are made need to be sent in uh, even uh, with more time than that. And again, the notion of the um, uh, adding to the agenda, again, I think Ms. Scott said it, We've had an opportunity to make notes uh, before meetings have ended if we have any additional items that we would like to have included on the agenda. And we're always able, unless I'm incorrect and I stand corrected, that prior to agenda setting that uh, members, is that correct, that prior to agenda setting you can ask one of the officers to add something? Thank you. Thank you. And also, we do agenda setting around the day or so. Yeah, I said that. <laughs> so, anyway, um, okay. And uh, Dr. Hager? Um, I, as if this uh, motion does pass and it does go back to the PRC, I, I'm, I really like reading the analysis and linking to the other policies. And so, I would ask that um, staff kind of find the um, precedent or the existing policies that support some of these actions because, I, again, the, the ones that were listed, I, I couldn't find where in other counties are following similar rules. And so I just would like to see the analysis expanded to kind of help to justify the, this type of approach to, to agenda setting and to the 24-hour motions. So that's it. Thank you. Okay. Could we um, take a vote, roll call vote, Ms. Gover, on um, the motion to move 8314 back to committee or to refer it back to committee? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pasture? No. <coughs> Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Favor seven. Okay, so then that one will go back to committee as well. Three fourteen. Okay, and um, next we have a eighty six zero one. I believe was next, Dr. Hager. Yeah. So this is the social media policy. Um, I, I really am grateful that um, the staff tackled this because I know this was a, a big, uh, a big new policy that we we have uh, taken on. Um, so once again, I read the the links in the um, in the analysis that the staff had done. Um, there was one link that didn't work to a policy in Louisiana, um, one to guidelines out of Texas, and then one to um, a New Jersey school board policy, which um, was helpful to read. And I just think that there's a that I think it's a great first step, but I think there are a lot of additional areas that could be addressed in a social media policy. And I'm a little bit concerned about the, um, the violation section and just how that will be enforced with, with, uh, within. And, and I just feel like, again, more, more content is needed to kind of elaborate on how we're going to do that. But then I think that there are areas of existing policies that we could adapt. And I was very surprised to hear at the meeting when I listened in that there is no Maryland LEA with a social media policy. Um, but uh, I imagine there are guidelines that exist somewhere out there similar to the Texas guidelines that we referenced. So this is just one that I, I felt that that I, I, I'm not comfortable personally with this draft. I think it, it could be enhanced a lot given um, that it's so important and that I'm, I'm really glad we're doing this. But I, I do think it just needs more more content, basically. So excuse me, Dr. Hager, if I could clarify, and I believe it's indicated in the policy analysis, that there are no other local boards in Maryland that have social media policy for board members. Mm -hmm. Not that there are no other LEAs that have social media policies, as you will see when the employee social media policy is brought forward next month. No other local boards have similar policies that control board member or indicate any sort of guidelines for board member conduct. No, and I appreciate that. And I, and I heard that discussion um, during the PRC meeting as well. So I, I, I just, um, 
again, I, I'm sure there are, there's a little bit more of an analysis that we can do given, given how important this is, especially with the Inspector General's uh, request that we have something like this. So, so that, that, those are my only comments. Thank you, Dr. Hager. And um, next, Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I too support the idea of a social media policy. However, I agree with Dr. Hager that the current version needs work, and I have some specific concerns. Um, one, it states that board members should not deliberate board business on social media. We're in the business of education. What we post is education related, um, matters of education in Baltimore County. I can see that being broadly um, construed to indicate deliberating board business on social media. So I believe that that needs expansion and specific definition about um, what constitutes board business or alternate terminology used. Because according to this, any matter we discuss on education could be construed as violation of the policy. Secondly, it states that board members shall not disseminate content generated by the board or the school system that the board or the school system has not already released to the public. So according to this, anything that is already public or um, discussed in open session that is not specifically or explicitly published by BCPS would also be a violation of the policy. So again, I think this needs clarification and definition um, pertaining to exactly what content. Um, it's, it's presumed and this discusses what confidential content is, and I agree that confidential content should not be shared. However, I think we need greater definition around public, already public content. Lastly, it states that board members should always conduct themselves online in a matter that reflects well of the board and the school system, which I agree, and shall avoid posting information that has not been verified and made public by the board or school system. Again, this places a constraint and it's vague in what is considered information that has not been verified, but verified by whom? Um, made public by the board or the school system. We don't publish a lot of information either as a board or as a school system around a lot of matters. So again, I feel we need um, further definition, further clarification around the publishing of content. Thank you, Ms. Thanks. Hen. Next, Ms. Rowe. I agree with everything that Ms. Hen said, and in particular that section E that says board members should always conduct themselves online in a manner that reflects well of the board and the school system and shall avoid posting information that has not have been verified and made public by the board or the school system. The fact of the matter is the IG's letter did not simply illustrate that board members were subject of complaints, but school system staff also were subject of complaints. And the letter suggested a policy that deals with both board members and all school system staff. And this policy subjects board members to a stricter set of standards than school system staff are participating in on Twitter. And so I do not believe that it's appropriate uh, when this board is the accountability and public facing accountability elected hybrid board for elected members to have what facts or information they can share be limited when in fact school system staff share anything and everything they want whether it's been disseminated by BCPS or not. So I, I object to this. Thank you, um, Ms. Rowe. Next, we have um, oh, Dr. Haig. Was that a question or actually, I can answer that. Um, next, it looks like uh, we have a comment from Ms. Mack. Yes, thank you, uh, Ms. Scott. Um, I, I agree with a lot of what is said. Um, I personally have problems with Section E and shall avoid posting information that has not been verified and made public by the board or the school system. Um, on my Facebook page, I sometimes post um, academic achievement data. I did not receive that data from the school system. I did receive it from a verified source, the Maryland State Department of Education, on the Maryland report card. And I would not want anybody to tell me that I cannot post information that I know to be accurate because it's provided to any user via a website. So um, I have a problem with a lot of this, but specifically that piece of it stands out to me. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Causey. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I also um, agree that we need to uh, really evaluate having this policy, and I'm grateful that we've started the work. But in the Policy Review Committee uh, meeting, I expressed uh, concerns about this policy that uh, were not addressed. Additionally, um, as was pointed out about content, um, there's content that c comes from a, a variety of sources, including research papers. We have we get articles from the National School Board Association. We get uh, a lot of content from the Maryland Association Boards of Education. There's a lot of issues in legislative session related to education that are informational to uh, constituents and stakeholders um, around education. So there's a, a whole manner of content that may be relevant um, that under this policy would be a violation. Also, I understand that um, the OIGE had provided some examples of uh, policies to consider um, that were forwarded in January, um, Anne Arundel uh, County Public Schools, it's an employee policy, but it also you know, could then be evaluated to be adopted. And the fact that they're in Maryland where we have our own Open Meetings Act laws uh, and things of that nature, I, I would like that to be fully evaluated, uh, along with a number of other policies, Washington County. Um, and it was uh, suggested to uh, look at the Baltimore County Police Department, which has a, um, social media policy that we could also evaluate. Um, so I, and I also would like to point out that uh, a board member cannot do board work on a Facebook page or any other social media for that matter. Um, board work is done with the board in an appropriate meeting. Okay. So for uh, some of the All issues right. related to, is a board member doing board work on a, on a Thank you, Ms. Facebook Causey. page? That's that's not okay. even relevant. Um, yes, and I, I just uh, wanted to interject briefly because I, I don't want us to get away from the reason why this social media policy came into being was because it was recommended from the Office of the Inspector General for Education. And these letters are on board docs, if um, the public or anyone else or any board members would like to review. But the Office of the Inspector General for Education has received numerous complaints concerning some board members' decorum while conducting meetings and communications through the use of social media with the Baltimore County Public Schools Board of Education. So there were numerous complaints about the behavior of board members. So we can't get away from that. This policy didn't drop out of the sky. This policy was not something that we just created just because it is a reason. And I have been directed, as the um, um, inspector general has said, he refers it to the chair for further action. So the action is to create a robust policy. And um, I believe it was Ms. Rowe who said board members are being held to standards that employees are not. But board members should be held to higher standards than employees because we are board members and we lead the school system. So it is not out. So this is not just falling out of the sky. And I think that we're getting away from the reason that this was created. So I just I just wanted to make sure that we said that. And I'm sorry. Um, I believe I skipped over Mr. Mahomes. Uh, I, my apologies, sir. I believe I was next, Madam Chair. I thought I saw further up where he um, had a comment. I apologize. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Mahomes. Uh, and, and then Ms. Hen. I'm Thank sorry, you. I was next, Madam Chair. Ms. I believe Ms. Hen already spoke. Yeah, so. Mr. Mahomza has not yet spoke, Ms. Hen. Go ahead, Mr. Mahomza. Yes, um, my, my comment slash question is not related to even the policy, but Ms., uh, I believe Ms. Rowe just, and I believe even you uh, mentioned it, that staff members have been posting on Twitter information that has not been verified by the school system. And since this meeting is going to be our official meet, uh, minutes and that's going to be published to the public. I would like for her to um, give an example or uh, of when has this occurred, because I think that's a big accusation. And if without any evidence against staff members and without even that being brought to the superintendent, I, I just think if we're going to say something like that to the public, it has to be factual and there has to be evidence provided. I'm happy to qualify that statement. Um, Madam Chair, excuse I'm me, I have a point of order. 
I do not believe uh, I'm, it is appropriate to discuss a specific personnel matter. So I think Mr. Mahamza has uh, uh, um, a point. One moment. I do not think that Ms. Rowe should respond with a specific okay. example regarding personnel. One moment, Ms. Galsey. Thank you for that. Um, Mr. Like Mahamza, were that. you responding asking for a specific example of, of an employee who has done something, or were you asking? Um, it doesn't even have to be a name of the employee, but uh, an information specifically that has been released without verification from the school system. Is that appropriate to ask? I don't know that um, that would be appropriate to ask. Mr. Bersades, is that an appropriate um, question for we, Mr. We would, want to, we would want to steer away from discussion of any particular employee action. Yes. I can qualify my statement. I, don't, I, I think we should go with, um, with the advice of Mr. Bersades. Uh, and I apologize um, for that, but I, I just think we have to be very careful if we're going to make that insinuation because I don't, I don't know what the current policy for uh, employees are, but I don't think any employee has ever released any information um, to the public, especially using their official account or speaking in their role. And if that's the case, I would like the superintendent, and this doesn't have to be in public, to um, investigate that because that is a very serious claim. Thank you, Mr. Mahomza. And now we have Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one last comment, and then I have a motion. Um, Professor Elliot King at Loyola College, who is a specialist in new media, commented to the media on the proposed policies, and specifically 8601, stating that the part of the policy he finds most objectionable is the portion that describes the possibility of sanction if guidelines are violated. I quote, it would be, if it would be legitimate for you to say that in a public open school board meeting, it's legitimate for you to say it online. So the last concern I wanted to express is with the sanctions um, that are austere. Um, we've received several public comments um, regarding their severity, and I would like the committee to revisit that. So with that, I'd like to move to refer policy 8601 back to committee to address the concerns raised by board members and the public. Second, Kazi. And if we could have that again in the chat. Yes, Madam Chair, it's in the chat. That was quick. Thank you, Ms. Hen. So Ms. Hen has moved to refer policy 8601 back to committee to address concerns raised by board members and the public. And it was seconded by Ms. Rowe and Ms. Yeah. Cole. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Gover, may we do a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Yeah. Oh, we're in the middle of a vote. Oh, Ms. Kazi? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Thank you. Thank you. And um, so that goes back to committee as well. Um, Ms. Um, Pester, you had a question? Okay, I had a comment, which is sort of uh, a moot point now. Um, and it goes to um, the whole issue of, um, it's a moot point. It's a moot point because it's going back and it's, it's just that, as Ms. Causey said, uh, and Ms. Rose said, staff and, and board members the IG's letter indicated policy and handbook. And my point was, and this is why it's moot now, because there needs to be an alignment between what's in our handbook and what the policy says. And Ms. Causey referenced Anne Arundel County, the sheriff's office, et cetera, the things that were in the letter. And as we create the handbook, policy, we are taking a look at that. And so they need to be in sync with each other. That was my point. Thank you. And next is 8221. That was, I believe, brought forward by Ms. Hen. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I have similar concerns regarding 8221 and would like to see the committee revisit this to add definition and clarification. 
Specifically, the policy change adds consequences for board members who speak on behalf of the board up to and including recommending that a board that a member be removed from the board. My two concerns are um, I would like to see greater definition on speak on behalf of the board because it could be something as minute as saying, well, the board thinks such and such based on a vote that was taken and passed, which would be a true statement um, given that the board has taken action on an issue. Secondly, it does not detail how the consequences would be administered and by whom. And I believe the board needs to um, make that clear and decide as a board how we want those. Um, one, to um, determine whether a violation has occurred and two, to det determine what consequence, if any, would be issued. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on 8221? Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion following that when I may. Yes. Thank you. I move to refer policy 8221 back to committee to address concerns raised by board members and the public. Second row. Okay. And if you could put that in chat. Ms. Pestor, you have a question. Do you want to say something? Okay. All right. So, um, Ms. Hen made a motion, and it's to move and refer policy 8221 back to committee to address concerns um, raised by board members and the public. And that was seconded by Ms. Rowe, I believe. And um, question from Ms. Causey. Madam Chair, um, did Ms. Hen speak to her motion? I believe she did. She, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Hen, you spoke to it actually before your motion was made. I, I did speak to it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. So I support sending this back. Um, I won't take a lot of time to express why, but I just think that um, there can be improvements that can be made. Additionally, clarifications around uh, what it means to be the spokesperson um, for the board, which is um, speaking on behalf of the board, positions the board has taken. So it's not, it's not, um, and and we we know this, um, but not everyone knows this that it's not the chair's opinion. It's the chair expressing the board's opinion or actions, uh, or so forth, um, and how and to clarify how that's separate from an individual board member um, expressing. Um, for instance, board policy, they're not speaking on behalf of the board, they're speaking on their own behalf, but they are using published um, documents and, and, and sharing information related to public documents. So there needs to be some clarification, I believe. I think it is um, appropriate to have a spokesperson on behalf of the board, and I think it needs a lot more clarity. And I also am concerned about the, the um, that really the punitive aspect was what was added without clarification. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Next is Ms. Rowe and then Dr. Hager. So one of the things that I think would improve these consequences sections of these policies greatly is I do not believe the consequences of this severity should be imposed upon a board member without being reviewed by the board's ethics review panel because they are independent and you can have, the, the board should not be deciding to impose consequences without review to the ethics review panel. So I, I would like to see language requiring the ethics review panel to investigate and review any accusations prior to um, anything being done to a board member. And I would like to see the recommendations for punitive actions against board members come from the board's ethics review panel, not other board members. I think that that's what the ethics review panel is there for. And I would like to see that language. Thank you, Ms. Rell. Next is Dr. Hager. I just had a question. It's very clear that it's the policy says only the board chair has the right to speak on behalf of the board. But aren't there circumstances where the board chair may not be able to speak and may appoint someone in, in their on their behalf? Um, it's just a small, small detail. But given the 
severity of the consequences. Again, it seems like there, there's maybe some. It is in there in the oh, it is? policy. Yeah, where the chair can appoint someone. Oh, I to apologize. Speak. I, mm -hmm. I did not see that. I'm sorry. Yeah. I take that back. And any other questions? Okay. So are we ready to take a roll call vote on um, the motion made by Ms. Hen to re refer policy 8221 back to committee? If we could do a roll call vote. Thank Ms. you. Ms. Rowe? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahonsa? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pasture? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is seven. Okay, so that goes back to committee as well. Okay, great. So, um, so we've reviewed our, all of our policies. All right, so our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens as appropriate. We will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public portion, the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those registered to call in by phone. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Meeting. Board practice limits, limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrants are, registrations are received, all who registered will be permitted to speak. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes and as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. Speakers, we ask that speakers to observe the three minute time limit and conclude remarks when time has expired and you hear the tone. The call will be ended and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education, participation by the public. It is the practice of this board to allow elected officials to provide their comments to the board. First to speak is Dr. Crystal Francis. Uh, good evening, um, Madam Chair, um, Dr. Williams, Superintendent, and members of the board. Thank you so much for all of your hard work on these challenging times, COVID-19. Um, I just wanted to make comments regarding the challenges of COVID-19 that have been brought to our attention. Um, I'm calling on behalf of, of course, the State Central Committee for, for uh, Baltimore County and would like the superintendent to just um, take note of some of the complaints that we've received via email regarding um, teachers reaching out indicating that some teachers in different schools do not have the appropriate PPE. Teachers are actually purchasing using their own money to buy materials to clean their classrooms. Um, and they don't believe that the school is currently following CDC guidelines as it relates to health check-ins. So I, I'm not exactly sure of, you know, how you know, what the superintendent has in place to ensure that all schools are following the appropriate CDC guidelines for ensuring that people are properly screened before entering the building. Um, so these are just concerns that were raised that we would like, you know, the board and the superintendent to look at further to, number one, ensure that teachers do have enough PPE, that they're not required to utilize their own funds to purchase that stuff for cleaning of the classroom and that 
this screening is taking place, the health check screening, so individuals who are being screened for COVID-19 symptoms before entering the building, that there are mechanisms in place to ensure that that screening is happening prior to entering the building because if a person that does have COVID is screened inside the building, contamination could have already taken place. And so that those are the uh, items I would like to bring to your attention. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next, we have um, Mr. Charles, Senator Charles Sidnor. Thank you and uh, good evening. Uh, I wanted to testify uh, briefly on two matters. One is school reopening as well as policy 8601. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge that there is no one who knows how this virus is going to continue affecting our county while we're moving forward towards the vaccination level that will protect everyone. With that, I appreciate the work that uh, our superintendent and the board is doing uh, as we're moving forward in person learning with all deliberate speed. There are a number of factors that we still do not know, and I urge this board to support his efforts as he does what is best for all BCPS students and not be swayed by those because they make or may be more vocal. Much has been made about the mental health challenges for students learning virtually, but less has been said about the anxieties that students must overcome to feel comfortable simply to sit in a classroom with others. I will share that uh, when this session first started for me in January, I was concerned about precautions that were being taken so as not to endanger myself or others. And even with those precautions, we still had concerns about HVAC systems as well as how this virus moved through those systems. I was concerned about colleagues not wearing masks appropriately and taking the precautions noted by our public health officials. So I'm thankful though that me and none of my colleagues have had been adversely affected by this disease. Before we had, and I would like to say before we even had an opportunity to examine how two-day um, week in-person schooling and virtual learning is working, I've heard that some parents are beginning to petition this board to open up buildings, not just for hybrid learning, but to fully open up schools for five days a week. I suspect when the system does open in that manner, despite the concerns, uh, that families and students may and still have, all students will be forced to return to regular classes five days a week. Now, I do not begrudge any family for wanting to send their children back to school if the school system is ready and capable of providing them with an environment safe from the virus. But I want the board to understand that this new push to reopen schools completely takes away my family's choice, and I find this un unacceptable and that some of our students are actually thriving within uh, the virtual learning. The information from the Equity Committee's report on hybrid learning cohorts clearly shows that when we are looking at hybrid and virtual learning, uh, uh, families in the West Zone are using virtual learning at a higher rate than those in Central and East Zone. So I simply ask this board to take that into consideration. With, res with regards to policy 8601, I was asked that the board, since it's going to be reconsidered, look at Davison versus Randall, which is a Fourth Circuit opinion, and make certain that you would also include how this board uh, tends to censor people after they've made comments on their pages. This has happened to me multiple times after statements have been made about me. And as an elected official, certainly I have uh, thick skin and I have no problem with people making comments, but uh, if comments are being made, one should be able to defend themselves and not be censored on those pages. So I hope that that will also be considered. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sidnor. Um, so next is our stakeholders. And for that, we have Mr. Ryan Coleman. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair, Dr. Williams and school board members. Uh, my name is Ryan Coleman. I'm the president of the Randallstown NAACP. I wanted to thank all the Randallstown members signing on tonight to listen to the school board meeting. Our mission is to advocate for all children, especially children of color. I've listened to every school board meeting since January, and I'm very frustrated. I'm frustrated <clears throat> with the disrespect that has been shown to Madam Chair. I'm frustrated with a lack of focus of increasing academic achievement and outcomes for all students especially students of color. I'm frustrated that this board has forgotten its purpose, which is the students of Baltimore County. 
The National School Boards Association has developed indicators of school board effectiveness. One, effective school boards are accountability driven, spending less time on operational issues and more time focused on policies to improve student achievement. This board spends most of its time on being rude to the chair, on agenda items, committee assignments, and micromanagement of Dr. Williams. Number two, Effective school boards commit to a vision of high expectations for student achievement and quality instruction and define clear goals towards that vision. The Baltimore County School Board rarely talks about instruction, curriculum, professional development, or academic achievement. Number three, effective school boards spend most of their time on increasing academic achievement, yet poor government is characterized by factors such as micromanagement by the board, confusion of the appropriate roles for the board members and superintendent, interpersonal conflict between board chair and members, and board member disregard for the agenda process and the chain of command. This is the Baltimore County School Board in microcosm. This is why over the past seven years, test scores, academic achievement, and educational outcomes are all trending down. The children are the ones that are being hurt by this, by the dysfunction of this board. I recommend that the board immediately add academic achievement to every agenda focusing on curriculum, instruction, and professional development to raise academic achievement and educational outcomes for all students, especially students of color. I recommend the board immediately come up with a comprehensive strategic plan with an implementation component to raise test scores and to address persistently low performing schools. Lastly, I recommend that the member stop filibustering the chair and her agenda. The boards in the past have failed, so we need a new direction. Anything less than this is educational malpractice. The Randallstown NAACP looks forward to partnering with the board and to hold the board accountable. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Cindy Sexton. Good evening, Chairwoman Scott, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Some students have now been back in school for three weeks. When I visit schools, I see clean buildings and many smiles behind masks. I've seen libraries, gyms, music rooms, classrooms, dismissal, recess, and lunchtime. The staff, the staff is doing all they can to engage our virtual students and our face-to-face -face students. This is hard work. Our educators are again going far above and beyond anything any of us could have imagined. Instruction is happening, and our educators once again found a way to make it work. But the challenges and obstacles haven't stopped. This week has already had Internet and Google Meet concerns. We're still gathering and working through payroll benefits and W-2 issues. At TABCO, we are getting calls, emails, and texts around the metrics in Baltimore County and the cases of COVID in schools. In spite of working to have health and safety teams at every work site, we still have confusion and concern over what is happening when there is a suspected case of COVID or a confirmed case. Now also add concerns over priority transfers and staffing in schools. Several weeks ago, I requested a special Board of Ed meeting to be held to address the questions and concerns around ransomware and reopening. That motion did not pass when this board voted on it. At that time, there were 92 pages of questions that our members have. Yes, some of them have been answered, but many have not. I will be sending those questions to the board after my remarks tonight. We still have questions around contact tracing, cleaning, mitigation, quarantining, accommodation, W-2s, pay concerns, leave balances, healthcare benefits, ventilation, vaccinations, transportation, ransomware, what the CARES money funding has been spent on and what's going on with our state retirement and pension and many more. We have been patient. We have given the system time. The patience is thin. Every change in the plan, new directive, and new concern adds to the angst and stress of a year that has already been full of angst, stress, and frustration. BCPS needs to work with the reopening plan they have. We need to give our students and our staff a chance to see the plan to fruition and not keep expecting our administrators to change schedules again, our educators to learn another new way to teach, our bus drivers to alter routes, and so many more changes. Let's work with the plan and give everyone time to settle into it. As educators, we know our students do best with a predictable routine. The reopening plan provides that. Let's allow that to be. 
We continue to ask for collaboration and communication around all the issues and concerns facing us, especially with reopening and ransomware. Let's do all we can to lower stress while still doing all we can for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Tom DeHart. Yes. Hello. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Scott. Good evening. And, uh, and members of the board. It's been a year Hello. since I've spoken. I'm sorry, Hello, excuse me. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. DeHart. I apologize for interrupting. Um, if everybody could mute because we're getting feedback. Yeah, I was hearing that as well. Okay. Thank you. Please go ahead. Okay, can I start over? Yes, apologies. <laughs> you may start over. No, no problem. Good evening, Chair Scott, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. It's been a year since I've spoken to the board, and while I've sent letters, it's a pleasure to be able to speak to you live, or at least virtually. While I haven't spoken to you in a year, I have been watching. So have teachers, school leaders, community members, various stakeholders, and most importantly, our students. Like the rest of the world, we've suffered through a pandemic that affects all of us. Additionally, we were hit with a cyber attack, which crippled our system. Leadership is important at any time, but with twin crises, leadership is crucial. Peter Stark says that in a moment of crisis, reaction set the leaders apart from the followers. I would ask the board members to reflect on their actions over the last year. Have you been cohesive, consistent leaders of our system uh, and community that the, our system and community want and deserve? This is obviously a rhetorical question. Every member of this board is a talented and intelligent person, and there will certainly be instances of healthy disagreement. But when there are clear and consistent signs of partisanship and to the outside observer, it often comes across as personal dislike for one another in too many instances. Any team or board is only effective when the individual members work together for a common cause. And quite simply, that common cause is all of our students. I have great respect for each of you and the time, effort, and energy you put into your role as a member of this board. And I get no personal satisfaction in bringing this up tonight. But there is an elephant in the room. The elephant is, that, is the unfortunate lack of respect and openness to others' opinions too often exhibited in the board's public meetings. This not only gets squarely in the way of leadership, uh, the leadership we need and deserve, but sets a tremendously poor example for all our stakeholders, especially our students. So I'm asking each of you tonight to leave partisanship at the virtual door of every future meeting and work collaboratively and cooperatively with one another to lead us through these twin crises and into the future. And in your collective leadership role, I ask that you keep former NBA champion Chicago Bulls coach Phil Jackson's words in mind. The strength of the team is each individual member. The strength of each member is the team. On behalf of the system leaders who I represent, as well as all stakeholders, I thank you in advance for much needed reflection and a reset as you work together to lead the Baltimore County Public Schools. Thank you and have a great evening tonight and a great meeting. Thank you. Next we have Ms. Kira Joseph. Greetings, Board President Scott, Vice President Hen, Dr. Williams and board members. For the past year, Procasti's focus has been on helping the black and brown school communities of color with basic needs such as food, shelter, and providing comfort to families of community members who have died from COVID-19. As the president of Pocasti, we are calling attention to a phenomenon that is occurring in BCPS for the reopening plans and our black and brown school communities. Einstein said, not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. This means in some situations, you must look at the qualitative reasonings and ask deeper questions. We have witnessed parent groups representing a few school communities monopolize news conferences, social media, and BCPS board meetings. These families provide one perspective on reopening. 
we ask the board to consider not making decisions on a single perspective representing one group of parents. We would like to know why the board is not paying more attention to your black parents and parents of color on the issue of reopening. Why are more black parents and parents of color opting to keep their children home on virtual learning than white parents? What are the COVID implications on our black communities and communities of color and the schools that serve these communities? The New York Times wrote an article in February called Missing in School Reopening, where they report approximately one-third of black families are not returning their children to school. The article highlights some possible factors as to why black families are not ready to have their children return. To further examine this same phenomenon that is occurring in Baltimore County Public Schools, we ask the board to complete the following action steps. Step one, look at the data of students who are returning by race, by school, and by zone. Two, conduct focus group discussions with black parents and parents of color on their concerns with returning their children to school. And three, Use the knowledge from step one and step two to inform decisions that support all students from all communities. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you. Next we have Dr. Danita Tolson. Good evening, Chairwoman Scott, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. I am Dr. Danita Tolson, president of the Baltimore County branch in NAACP. Um, it appalled me that we are not talking also about student curriculum and more about the students. But I'm going to go on to say um, this board selected Dr. Williams in July 2019, 18 months into his first year on the job, at a time when a new superintendent should be getting the lay of the land and um, learning his job. However, COVID-19, the pandemic, forced the closure of the Baltimore City Public Schools for the remainder of the year. Dr. Williams and his staff halted the, the in-person learning and switched to completely virtual learning. Eight months after beginning the pandemic, the district was blindsided with a ransomware attack that completely broke down the infrastructure of the district's operating system. After a closure of only two days, Dr. Williams and staff were able to resume virtual instruction. For months after the ransomware attack and during a global pandemic, the district is now providing hybrid instruction for two days a week for in-person instruction um, athletes for students, athletics for students with allowance for fans to watch and vaccines for the Baltimore County teachers. During the last board meeting, several board members spoke about their constituents. Dr. Williams often speaks of family engagement. It leads me to wonder, what are the board members doing to reach out to their constituents, including the NAACP? This board should be focused on real solutions during the most challenging times for all Baltimore County communities. That includes more discussions on the students and curriculum. So while making sports available to students with a full house of uh, secular, excuse me, um, watch viewers may be important for some. However, our constituents are also more concerned about balancing out the population with the available resources to decrease the overcrowding. There's a lack of equitable experiences for black and brown students and underperforming schools across the system, even in some wealthy communities in the county. With this important issues plaguing the district, I take notice of several policies on the agenda to tonight school board meeting. All but one are in reference to the internal board policies. While this board is caught up in questioning every decision of the chairwoman, real issues are falling by the wayside and hurting our students and community. We look forward to continued conversations, including the equitable yet balanced approach 
to a return to in-person learning Thank you. while maintaining a robust virtual component for those students. Thank you, Dr. Tulsa. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, that was um, our stakeholder groups. We've completed that. Uh, next, we have general public comment. And our first speaker is Ms. Diana Bergman. Good evening. Do you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Buenas tardes, Senora Makita Scott, Senora De Factor Vice Chair Julie Han, y Superintendent Dr. Williams, el Presidente de nuestra escuela. Oye mi canto, lo que estoy escribiendo, lo que voy a decir hoy. I want you to listen to what I have to say today. I want this board to look at policy 200. It's the basic board commitments of responsibility and duties for our school system. I've been observing this board for almost a decade now. Um, our previous appointed board and our current hybrid board. When you look on the BCPS website, one of the things that we have is a shrinkage of the About Me page. There's one sentence that says, the Board of Education of Baltimore County is authorized by Maryland law to determine, with advice of the county superintendent, the education policies of county school system. And I find it very hard pressed to believe that this current board is having such a difficult time respecting that. I have witnessed certain board members still um, make allegations against our staff. We're no longer looking at how we help our students. We're no longer putting our children first, our education system first, our teachers. What, when's the last time anybody asked our teachers what they needed? Did we, did we get input from everybody? Do we have meaningful two-way communication, like it says in our other policy on how we engage the public. Community relationship, policy 1270. We're supposed to have meaningful two-way um, communication, especially with our families that are part of Title I schools. So we have a lot of things to work on, and it's very hard when people's priorities are more worried about their activity on social media and whether or not they agree with an opinion. You want to talk about um, how this board does things? Well, you know what? Tonight we still have a lot of testimony to do. And what I keep seeing is BCPS's version of filibustering and people being upset about their First Amendment rights, but they didn't think about someone's First Amendment right as a parent or teacher, or staff, or even a student when they express their opinion of our education system. So a lot of these things, I just want you guys to know that you're on the record on how you vote. The words you use to choose, they matter. And at the end of the day, as public figures, guess what? You serve the taxpayers, us parents, us educators, a student. Thank you, Ms. Bergman. It's going to turn around. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Bergman. Next, we have Kate Kreider. Okay. Ms. Kreider? Yes. Okay, yep. You're next, Ms. Kreider. All right, thank you. Oh, actually, you're on right now. You can go ahead with your statement. Okay. Next, we have Kate Hello, thank you, and good evening. Um, I'm a parent of uh, two children. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, hello. Okay, great. <laughs> thank you, and good evening, everyone. Um, I'm calling as a parent of two children. Okay. All right. Thank you and good evening. Um, I'm calling as a parent of two children, a kindergartner and a fourth grader. And I would just like to call so that I might share some feedback on our, our, our families' virtual learning and hybrid learning. 
Miss Kreider, you should probably mute your uh, background. My... We're hearing a little feedback. You should mute oh. your computer. Yeah. I apologize for the interruption. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I have a kindergartner and a fourth grader, and I just want to share our family's feedback on the virtual and hybrid learning. Uh, my kindergartner has started uh, the hybrid learning uh, several weeks ago, and I just want to say that we are very happy um, with uh, that um, that process. Uh, we feel we've had great communication with the school. Um, he's so happy to be back in school, and um, my daughter should be starting in a couple weeks as she's in fourth grade. And I just really want to share that um, we felt the school administrators and the teachers are working so hard and um, have been really clear communicating all the information that we need and the safety procedures. And again, I just want to go ahead and share that with the board. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Kreider. Next, we have Francine Chandler. Okay, thank you. So that ends our um, general public comment. And next is public comment on policies. And our first speaker, and I believe our only speaker on policies, is Ms. Diana Bergman. Hello, Madam Chair. Can you please um, help me? Um, yes. Are we going to be speaking about every single policy or only the ones that were not removed? Um, you, you can speak on whichever policies you would like. And what I was going to do was read the um, policies you selected, the first one, and then just go in that order. Okay, that will be helpful. Can you please um, state the first policy? Yes, I can. So the first one um, that you selected is policy 6002, selection of instructional materials. So policy 6 Zero, zero, two. I agree with policy 6002. It should reflect of all student groups. We should also consider language of instructional materials and tools that reflect all groups of learners. Under section two definition, the language that needs to be added is in large print. It should be added as well as much needed software for real time interpretation for those with language barriers. This policy here going over, and we've heard discussion regarding this policy. Um, I'm going to pull it up here a second. Pardon me. Because it's a lot of policies, but I want to make sure I get a chance to speak on them. The policy for selection of instructional material and the added that's the language that's being um, added on here in bold. We we have technology that is helping a lot of our students. Our students with a lot of challenges when it comes to learning. And we want to make sure that we don't limit ourselves on identifying resources of materials of exactly what they could access, what the combination is to learning on how our children learn today. Okay? Not how they learned 20 years ago, not how they learned 40 years ago. There is so much technology research that supports children and the way children learn. From audio support, different tools, and having the flexibility to be able to enter into contracts with vendors to support those new, new unique ways of how we provide instruction. That's one of the things that I know a lot of people had noticed, is how do you get, during COVID, that you're doing virtual learning, how do you get support to instructional materials? that are not available in your physical home because they're left behind in the classroom. And I think we should have some language to be able to identify that. For students that are learning virtually, they, they still ha have access to those learning instructional materials, regardless of what environment the student learner thrives in, whether it's hybrid, in-person, or um, virtual. This is something that we, we think we need, we need to have that conversation 
What is it that's not included in here that clearly identifies so it's not an issue, especially when it comes to a large print and, and Braille? for special education students and advanced technology and software that we have for students with language barriers that we offer real life, real interpretation uh, of the student's native language so they can access the curriculum. So that that's my concern with policy 6002. Thank you, Ms. Bergman. And next is policy 8221, board officers chair, vice chair duties. Okay, so this policy, I have, sorry. It pulled up the, the analysis and I wanted to pull up the duties of the responsibility. I had mentioned in my testimony earlier um, regarding the rules and the responsibility of all board members, not just the chair or the vice chair. And it pertains to how our students achieve, how we align and use the advice and guidance from our superintendent. And we define those guidelines of what the board actually believes. So when I'm looking at this policy and listening to board members in discussion regarding policy 8221 and the rest of the policies discussed tonight, um, you know, it's one of those things where the, the chair, there has to be, you know, you put out one through seven of different things that are prioritized. I'm looking at this and what does it have to do with instruction? Like there should be some language added in there that the chair and the vice chair um, agree with what we have outlined in policy 200, some kind of guidelines of what we believe for our school system that has to do with education. You know, not just acting as, oh, I'm the board, you know, the board person and worry about if the board chair has too much power over the representation of the whole board. Like there's nothing on there that's talking about that you're going to support our superintendent, you're going to support our education system, you're going to support our student and make sure that they're high achievers. Um, we have federal laws to, that we have to apply to to be able to receive federal funds when it comes to Title I um, and stuff like that, the way we communicate with the public. So, yeah, those things that are added and currently there are just procedures of what we expect a board chair to do, but we should have higher expectations that the belief of whoever takes the role of that chair and the vice chair is going to be driven towards improving the education experience of, of our students and our teachers. And I'm just heartbroken that it's, it's not added on there. And it shouldn't be number eight. It should be number one. That should be the number one priority. Uh, of the board chair is that we have some kind of language acknowledging that the board chair's responsibility and duty is to work hand in hand as a team supporting our school system. And it's missing. It's missing here. It doesn't clearly define that. And to me, we should have that high expectation of clearly putting that out there, that education for our student achievement is Thank you. Priority. Thank you, Ms. Bergman. And the next one is policy 8311, meetings. So this is regarding the meetings. And I know we heard a lot of discussion. About the meetings. For 8311. So I want to share a story. This hybrid board, I remember witnessing. Um, one of the first, I think, I believe it was their second hybrid meeting in their term. And one of the first meetings that they had that I felt was completely disconnect is how they changed the way um, agenda items are added to the agenda. It used to have to be a, like a majority vote with it, and it was changed. But it was changed without without input from the public. We changed the policy, skipping input from the po from the public. Like, we were not engaged in that conversation. They didn't even consider that. 
it, it didn't even come up for discussion. It was just you guys voted and you did that and you didn't ask anything whatsoever. You did not ask a single stakeholders group. You did not ask a single student member, anybody, how we felt about that and the structure that it was just automatically changed, deleted without a chance. And, and then we have board members now talking about First Amendment rights. Well, what about Open Meeting Act? And how about following po policy and procedures for how you set up your agendas to make sure that you create that communicate, um, community engagement like you're supposed to? So I, I want to see language on there and uh, put back exactly um, similar to what was before. And it goes on the record on how board members um, commented regarding this policy. Is my three minutes up for that policy? No, you have a minute and 11 seconds. Oh, okay. You know, we, we saw the same thing happen, too, how it came up on the agenda to change um, with the board in the past, to change if we had first reader, second reader, and third reader. Like, you just, like, skip the step in between. And it used to be, like, it came up for first reader, and then it came up for second reader separately, and then the public got to comment, and you guys took it back and work on it, and then it came out, and it was amended. We don't even have that anymore because, again, that was taken away without consideration on how the public felt about it, you know? And your board members, your elected officials, your appointed officials, you are supposed to be serving us, the taxpayer, our educators, our students. You're, that's who you you so swear an oath to, to, to do. So I, I don't understand how some members could sit there and talk about, oh, they object to something, they object to this and object to that. This is putting some structure in place to help you guys get along. Like, stop objecting to stuff. So... That, you know, that's my input about that. I think I'm up. Thank you. Yep. All right. And the next is policy 8314. Ms. Bergman, that's meetings agenda. Eighty three fourteen. Um, again, that has to do with, with what I said, that this board has a responsibility and supposed to serve us, the taxpayer, the public. When we are looking at these policies here on how you run your meetings and your agendas and how you set things up, you guys have to think about other things too. You know what, what really bugs me? I'm gonna share with you guys what really, really bugs me, okay? It bugs me that right now we have vendors that we are in contract to actually help our children learn, waiting, waiting. But you guys debate back and forth on all this stuff in the public, and we get to see how everybody votes and stuff. We have people that are actually ready to work, have been working very hard for our kids and our educators, waiting to present their presentation. Okay? Why don't we allow those presentations to be put on the agenda ahead of time? Okay? I always thought it was very disrespectful in the past when everybody – got to talk about whatever, and then we waited, and everybody waited patiently to announce who we hired for our system. They had to wait there the whole freaking night, the whole night waiting, and, you know, we didn't seem to appreciate someone that we just hired into Team BCPS, and we didn't consider their time and their time away from the family. We just kept them there, which is what we're doing right now. You guys have been filibustering a lot of these meetings. Uh, we have our BCPS staff and a lot of people waiting around to give you a presentation that actually has to do with our children achieving their education experience and access to instruction and what we do during this whole difficult time of COVID. So we, we, we have these people waiting around and we don't prioritize them and we should because they're prioritizing education of what this board is supposed to accomplish. So again, you're on the record. You continue to be on the record. You shouldn't get upset when people point out things that you've done that's been on the record that goes against educating our children. That's gonna continue to be an ongoing issue. Wherever I catch you, wherever I see you, I'm gonna bring it up. You're on the record for doing X, Y, and Z. I wanna know why you did, did that. And I wanna know how you plan to improve our school system as a whole and make it about education and make it about our kids and our teachers. So that's what I have to say about policy um, 8314. 
about these meeting agendas that you guys should consider how well you treat others and, and our school system as a whole. Thank you for that. Were you finished, Ms. Bergman, with 8314? Yeah, I'm, I'm done with 8314. Okay. Let's um, to the next one. Okay. Well, actually, um, Ms. Brenda Pfeiffer called in, and she would also like to speak on 8314. So I was going to let her speak on that, and then, then we'll go to the next one. Oh, Ms. Welcome. Ms. Pfeiffer? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you so much. Um, good evening. I heard that there was already some robust discussion about this um, by board members. So as I speak, I think you'll hear that I share some of their concerns. And um, I'm pleased that this has been sent back to committee. But let me share what I have tonight. Um, I do have two main concerns that were brought up. The first is the requirement that motions um, to the board meeting agenda be submitted 24 hours in advance. And we all know that things can happen up to the last minute. Um, they can get board members can get more information or speak with stakeholders. We even heard tonight that some board members are saying they don't even always get all the information they need for the board meeting within that 24 hour window. And so requiring this 24 hour advance notice to amend the agenda or to submit a motion to amend just seems like it's going to delay board um, work even more because if it's not received in time, the issue may have to wait until the next meeting or even later, potentially delaying some business by a couple of weeks, a month, maybe even more depending on how long it takes. And I just feel like this would be a huge disservice to the students, to the teachers, and to the families of BCPS to keep delaying work that needs to be addressed. Um, I know that the board has operated without this requirement very well for a while, and I'm confident that um, the chair could continue to take board motions in at the time and run the meeting smoothly. So I feel like this change to policy 8314 is unnecessary, and it could even hinder the work of the board. Uh, the other amendment to this policy that was also discussed tonight um, was changing the number of required votes to amend a board meeting agenda from the current requirement of a majority to the proposed requirement of a unanimous vote. Um, for one, this is just really not consistent with other board action. Other work of the board requires a majority of vote, and it doesn't make sense to require a unanimous vote simply to amend a board meeting agenda, while the other important work of the board requires only a majority of members to be in agreement. Uh, also, any single member of this board really would have the power to block certain action simply by not voting for an amendment on the agenda, even if all other 11 members of the board agree on that amendment. Think about that. 11 members are in agreement, one member doesn't agree, and that member can just block the action by not getting something on the agenda. This really has the potential to cause a serious roadblock in board action. Um, and ultimately, the potential exists that once the agenda is set by the chair and the superintendent, it would become all but impossible for the agenda to ever be changed, effectively blocking certain items from ever being addressed. So I believe that these changes could have a serious negative impact on the board's ability to get needed items on the agenda and to get work done. So I don't believe that either of these changes to policy 8314 are in the best interest of the board or the best interest of the students and teachers and families that they represent. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Pfeiffer. Next, um, we go back to Ms. Bergman, and she's going to make a comment on board policy 8360, ethics code, uh, ethics code um, applicability and definitions. Go ahead, Ms. Bergman. Hi. I'm here to speak about policy 8360. First, I would like to start off by saying, did you guys know and I don't know if anybody has brought this up, but this is something I noticed. The ethic review panel, they're selected by the Board of Ed. And I'm just here wondering if the Board of Ed has power to elect the ethic review panel. Isn't that a conflict of interest when we're looking at stuff? You know, just let that set in for a minute. Because usually when we have people reviewing things like that, violations or whatever the case is, that's usually a third party entity outside okay so there's no biased decision made or anything but the ethic review panel that reviews stuff for baltimore county's board of ed okay it is selected by appointments of board members they pick those five people and i don't think it should be five i think it should be seven at least to have proper representation of geographic um of, of the county as a whole we're a big county so here on Section 2 on Definition um, B, there's new language added. 
and there's language being deleted. The deleted language says person engaged in business, whether profit or nonprofit, regardless of form. And here's the thing. If this, if this is an issue regarding profit versus nonprofit, why are we just going with the operation for profit? There's a lot of companies out there that we want to question um, what their true intent is, okay? Do we have to remind everybody of what happened with um, everybody with all these elite ID schools and stuff, of the rich and famous getting prioritized for colleges and all that conflict of interest that happened all over the place? Um, we don't want to get ourselves in that mess. We already have a mess that we still haven't figured out how to resolve. So we shouldn't have any conflict of interest, whether it's a nonprofit or a for-profit. I think the the language needs to be there that we should make sure that we're not entering into any kind of conflict of interest when it comes to these um, contributions and stuff. Then it talks about more contributions. And that's another thing I think that needs to happen. You know, I'll talk about that in the social media policy when it comes to other businesses too, because some board members also have other um, private little entities of profits and stuff like that. So um, they should be able to identify what that business is ahead of time and make sure that they're not trying to promote any kind of business um, with our school system to sell, you know, pig soap or whatever it is they want to sell or, or books or whatever. So we, we need to think about that stuff here and, and look at the makeup of this um, ethic review panel, too, because I don't, I don't think it's right that the board gets to pick who investigates them if they do ethic violations. I mean, when is it fair to investigate? Thank you, Miss. That's not fair. That's not right. Miss Bergman, so, thank um, you. That was the time for that. Okay, looks like we were getting some feedback. Thank you. Okay, the next one you have, um, Miss Bergman, is policy 8361, ethics code, statement of purpose, and policy. Okay, so 8361 is yes. another ethics um, code statement for purpose of the policy. Um, pretty much it stays um, the same. There's little details I've noticed, deleting grammar. You know, someone's editing the grammar of the policy. Overall, it kind of looks at the recommended behaviors for um, members of the school board candidates and members of the school board and superintendent employees. Each of these individuals shall be subject to the ethics code. Okay, so this this policy right here, 8361, established, uh, you know, behavior-wise of everybody, okay, which is, which is a thing I hear a lot about teachers. Like, you know, and you guys talked a little bit about this, not too much about this, but a little bit about it. Um, why doesn't the board are held to the same standards of expectations about their behaviors, regardless if it's on social media or not? You know, out and about, whatever they do, we, we have the same expectations out of our teachers. We actually have too much expectations out of our teachers. They're supposed to do everything, like, uh, like Inspector Gadget. Remember that guy? So... It's same thing for for board. Like ethically, shouldn't we have high expectations of our board members and their behaviors? Shouldn't we make sure that board members are being transparent that they're following procedures and the handbook, that they're not going around behind people's back lobbying other lawmakers without telling anybody because that's not cool. No, that's not cool at all. But we've had some board members that have actually, um, you know, gone to. To, to lawmakers and said, we want this, we want this, and the poor legislative committee chair has no idea that XY members went to go lobby our, our lawmakers. So that type of behavior, unacceptable, you know better, you know. But I think it, it outlines it here. Maybe it needs to be more specific in policy 8361. Maybe that would be helpful. So that, that that's my two cents regarding policy 8361. Thank you, Ms. Bergman. Next is uh, policy 8362, ethics code gifts. Oh, this is a big one here. Mm -hmm. I see some added language here. Oh, man, these gifts. Let me tell you, when it comes to some of our board members, I don't think people think before they speak or write sometimes. 
because I honestly don't think that because you made a mistake and maybe you know you made a mistake and you had to hit the reset button. I don't think it's right that you offer somebody some kind of gift. To me, that's like a bribe. Okay, you don't bribe people to hush up, hush, hush up, because you know you made a mistake and you don't want anybody else to find out. So we have added language here regarding economic value, regardless of the form, without adequate and lawful consideration. Gift does not include contribution as defined in the election law article. Oh, see, that grabs my attention. And the Dodic Code of Maryland or any other provision of state or law. So what makes you so special that the same standard set by Maryland law doesn't apply to you, board members? You're elected officials. Some of you are. Um, that doesn't seem fair. You have to run a campaign and everything. Who's giving you what for what promises? And how does that impact our children? Does that mean that some kids are getting a, a better deal with their education because of certain gifts are being contributed by X, Y, and Z? Or... Some kids are being left without. We're not doing that anymore. The haves and the haves not argument, that is getting so old. It is getting so old, this last century old, okay? Because we passed the blueprint. I remember when you guys voted in support of the blueprint. Remember that? And it was supposed to be a world-class education for everybody, and that money's supposed to be rolling out. We're not doing favoritism here. We're not adding new um, elite companies that have a history of doing bad business when it comes to education because they've never actually taught children. They're just in it for money. So let's talk about that if you want to talk about that. But, yeah, we have to pay attention to this policy here and outline, um, and we should meet the, the requirements with this gift. Like, we can't be gifting people anything, you know, um, that that's expensive. That's not cool. Like, you know, it just, it's not happening. It's not happening. It shouldn't happen. You guys have to have a conversation about this because it's not cool. No, not at all. All right, let's go on to the next policy. Okay, thank you. The next policy is 8363 Ethics Code, Conflict of Interest, Prohibited Conduct. Oh, this conflict of interest thing. Let me tell you. With technology that we have nowadays, okay, there is absolutely no reason, no excuse that we can have a dashboard. A dashboard that gives us, like, automatic, you know, information. You know, um, we end up having, like, this whole thing here, right, where um, board members have to fill out their financial disclosure form, Okay. And not only do they have to fill out their financial disclosure form, they also have to disclose if there could be any potential of conflict of interest. Remember that meeting that we had and somebody tried to make a motion about a stakeholder group being added in the middle of public comments without following actually policy and procedures of BCPS? Okay? That's a big no-no. That's a big conflict of interest. If a lobbyist group is out there acting and behaving like a lobbyist group, they must register. Not only do they must register if a board member has contributed to that lobbyist group, they must disclose it in a financial um, disclosure form. And me, as a public member, uh, it takes forever to get that feedback, okay? You have to put in a mail, print out the paper, uh, you know, U.S. Postal Service, it ain't running that quick like it used to. So we have to send that out and then wait forever to then look at those financial disclosures and and this whole time, we could use technology, put it out there so we know which lobbyist group has to register. We could put out there, you know, which board members we have to watch to make sure that they recuse themselves from a vote or any action on the board because they contribute financially to, to, to a lobbyist group. So that's a conflict of interest. There's other conflicts of interest, too. Like if you have a, a, a different business as a board member, you know what? You should report that you have another business and you should not be selling to our teachers or our principals or anybody about your, your private little business, okay? You can't be selling books or, or, or travel deals, you know, or, or any pig soap. That's not happening. That's a conflict of interest, okay? And the pig soap, I don't have nothing against pigs. I like pigs, okay? I like pigs. But the pig soap, honestly, is a little bit, like, overpriced. But it has nothing to do with education. Nothing to do at all with education. So we have to pay attention to these companies and make sure that they're not over here, you know, 
a conflict of interest with our board members because you're supposed to be focused about the kids, focused about the kids, not about all the special little kids and in these conflict of interest. So that's what I have to say about policy 8363. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bergman. Next is policy 8364, ethics code, financial disclosure statements. The financial disclosure statement. Let me tell you, I ran out of ink. I had to go to Walmart to buy some more ink for my printer because you have to print out the, the form that's on BCPS. And, you know, I want to give a, a shout out to our technology department because let me tell you, They've gotten some of those forms back up. Those forms are very important, okay? So you have to sit here and print these out. And, again, I don't see no language of advancing advancing this stuff. I saw that you guys added a bunch of names. It says here, Section B. This policy applies to all Baltimore County School BCPS, you deleted, and the employees with the following job titles, administrator, administrator, chief auditor, assistant superintendent, um, audit officer. I'm looking at all this. Um, where's the board members? Like, board members, you're not on here. Like, oh, wait, designated employees by the board. No, where did our board members go? Are they on here? Hey, who, who took the board members out? Wait, you know what? We need to add the board members. Oh, wait, it's up here. Except the student board members, okay? So student board member doesn't get all mixed up in this mix. But the policy applies to all board members. It's in the very top front. But now they added everybody else to the party. To, again, an ethic review panel to look at this and investigate this. Selected by who? No, not an outsider, selected by the Board of Ed, the current Board of Ed members. Now, wouldn't one think that this could go very wrong, very south, very quick? Because this right here could be used as retaliation against our administrator, assistant chief auditor, our assistant superintendent, our audit manager, our chief, our community superintendent, the comptroller. We have a comptroller in BCPS? Okay, I guess we have a controller in BCPS, the coordinator, the director, the executive director, the physical officer. There's a whole bunch of people, this manager, even the minor, the minority business enterprise consultant, um, whatever. But you guys are here, again, changing these ethical policies. And the big conflict of interest is that the ethic review panel is appointed by the board member. And it should be an outside party investigating these allegations and questions that people have. So that's my take on policy 8364. Thank you, Ms. Bergman. Next is policy 8365, ethics code lobbying. Oh, man. Ethics code and lobby. I had an issue with, you know how intense this is? <laughs> Let me tell you, I was reading this policy. Look at that pursuit of the board education policy 8365 that's the registration form where's the policy here uh, no that's the analyst report here's the nope that's the report page again here's the policy draft so we have a policy statement and it's going over, they're changing some numbers from three to two, uh, from four to three. And it talks about the ethic review panel. And it defines lobbying, okay? Communication in the presence of a member of the school board or any school official with the intent to influence any official action of that member of the school board or officer and spending over $25 for food, entertainment, or other gifts during the calendar year in connection with the communication or intent to influence or, okay? Um, number two, engaging in activities, having the express, um, express purpose of soliciting others to communicate. Um, again, it goes back to that meeting we had with the lobbyist group that failed to register. I couldn't find them registered to anybody. I watched that group behave as a lobbyist group in Annapolis. 
um, yeah, they did. They actually were asking for vouchers, okay, vouchers. Um, they were asking for money to have online learning, okay, without any state oversight. We're not doing that. Not happening, okay? The Maryland Blueprint, we worked really hard. We got our board supporting the Maryland Blueprint since 2016 before we even knew what we were doing to figure that out. We're not going to have these little groups come out of nowhere that don't want to follow the rules, go there and influence board members, lawmakers, whoever the case is, without following procedures, without registering, and, and, and feeding people. That's not cool. Okay, they have to register. They have to communicate that. We should be able to see what lobbyist group are doing. Hello, dashboard. That's the new thing now. Okay, we're supposed to have dashboards. We have technology. Okay, board docs to me is a little bit outdated. It gets a little frustrated. I know it gets a little frustrated for everybody else too. It should be more interactive, more easy to search. And we should be able to see the activity reports too of the lobbyist group. So, who they talk to and when, okay? We should be able to know that. You know, we have this um, privacy information act. We can request information and stuff. Like the lobbyist group, they have to file. Okay. And it should be a penalty if they don't file. Time, Ms. Bergman, okay. for that one. Thank you. So the next one is ethics code, excuse me, 8366, ethics code, ethics review panel. Okay, see, this is the ethics review panel that I was talking about earlier that I kept mentioning that I think is a conflict of interest policy statement. There is an ethics review panel of the Baltimore County Public School BCPS that consists of five appointed by the Board of Education of Baltimore County. Okay? This is what I call investigating yourself on issues, okay? That's not a real investigation when you investigate yourself. It is not a real investigation when you appoint the person investigating you. What kind of investigation is that? I mean, talk to any professional investigator. You know what? Maybe we should talk to our um, new state inspector general. Let's call Richard up and ask him if that's a conflict of interest. And five members um, appointed? Why five? Why five? We have seven districts. Okay, Baltimore County is very huge, it's very big, okay? How do we know that in this language, we're not picking five people that live in the same area of Baltimore County? How is that fair? Do you hear testimony from everybody else that the west side of Baltimore County, things aren't going as peachy and as great as it is for other people? So we should have at least opportunity to have an, a, a completely different process of how we select our ethics review panel. It has to be fair. I don't think the board should be appointing this. I don't think, you know, the school system should be appointing this either. Um, maybe let's call, I don't know, our boy Johnny O, the county assessor. Let's ask him how he can help. Because I know he said to me a bunch of times before he's happy to help when it comes to dashboards and stuff. So why not have a panel that represents all of Baltimore County, that has experience, and that doesn't have any ties, any ties and cannot be swayed or... Um, you know, feel bad about saying something because so-and-so friend got them on the ethics review panel, you know? Um, so that's kind of my issue with with this whole thing. Like, it is really long. Have you guys read some of this stuff on Policy 8366? Have you read all the stuff regarding the internal operations of ethic codes? It gets boring unless you're a policy nerd and you like reading policy. It's, it's you know, it's overwhelming. But the terms, that's another thing. They're able to serve two five-year terms, two five-year terms until the another person comes up. Like, that is a long time to be there. That's, that's five years is a long time term. I don't think there should be t term limits, really. You know what? Maybe they should have a two-year term and no term limits, you know? And it, it sounds very silly. Like, you know, Congress doesn't have term limits. A lot of people think they should, but they don't. But you get experience. So you pay attention to a lot of these little boards that people don't know what they do, but they do really big things for our school system. They do some major investigations, some major opinions that they form and stuff. And you have to pay attention to what happens okay. and how we select it. Time. That's Thank you, Ms. Bergman. Um, so the, ne the last policy um, you had on here is policy 8601, use of social media. Okay, so this is a big one, the social media policy. Okay, 
the inspector general wrote not one, but two, two letters, two letters to this board, because we have board members going wild. Okay, not cool, not cool to have board members going wild. Okay, not cool to go on the record and say that you're against something that we need. We need this. The reason why we need this to have the social media policy so this board could move forward and actually educate and help our students and teachers. That is why we need the social media policy. There's been too much nonsense on social media, okay? Hiding, deleting, comments, muting people, just because you don't like their opinion, okay? That is unacceptable, okay? Then you want to talk about, oh, First Amendment rights. What about people's First Amendment right when you delete their comments and the way they express themselves about their education? And going back to that policy 1270 about community engagement, okay? Community engagement. How do you have meaningful two-way communication if you've muted or deleted or blocked somebody? How is that communication meaningful with a parent, with a student, with an educator? Like, shame on you for saying elsewhere. This is the type of thing that we need. Unfortunately, we need and we must have it because it, it, it has violated the First Amendment rights, not to a board member, but to the public, the public that you're supposed to serve. We, the people that you're supposed to help, okay? We expect this board to support our superintendent. You guys hired him. Work with him, communicate, have meaningful two-way communication with him and his team, Okay? Stop cutting stuff, and, and, and we barely have any more money. Did you see the audit compared to our nearby jurisdiction? We barely have any more money. What else are you going to cut? How is that helping our students and teachers get educated in Baltimore County? Okay? While your focus, instead of addressing how we barely have enough money to educate everybody, okay, your focus is on social media nonsense, Okay? I've even seen some board members promote their personal little business on their social media platform. That's a big no-no. You should not do that. So this social media policy, you know what we need to do also that's not added on here, no one's brought up? We need to add some kind of register system, a way that board members have to register which social media platform they are using so our school systems identified that platform has been registered, and you must also register whatever small business that you have to make sure that you are not promoting financial gain using your board member platform, okay? Nobody has talked about that. Thank but you, Ms. We Bergman. We definitely should. Thank you, Ms. Bergman. That's time. So um, we also we also have um, Ms. Bergman. Yes, thank you, Ms. Bergman. Um, now we have Brenda Pfeiffer, who would like to speak on 8601, use of social media as well. Okay, thank you. Good evening again. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, so we know that the stated purpose of this new social media policy is to lay out standards for board members when using social media and other online platforms and to define the potential consequences if those standards are violated. Um, I am not speaking tonight to argue for or against having a social media policy in, in general. However, I do believe that this particular policy is simply not a good policy and it needs to be rewritten, so I'm glad that it was sent back to committee tonight. Uh, generally, I just think that the language in this policy is simply too vague to be effective. For example, the policy states that board members should always conduct themselves online in a manner that reflects well of the board and the school system. Um, but I'm wondering how this will be interpreted. Does a board member have a right to respectfully disagree with the school system, or could that be interpreted as not reflecting well of the school system? It's a little unclear from reading the policy. Also, the policy prohibits board members from deliberating board business on any online platform. But what does that mean? I listened to the policy review committee meeting in which the policy was discussed, and our student board member asked some very good questions, clarifying questions about what might count as deliberating board business online. But in that meeting, he really wasn't able to get clear answers to those questions. So how is a board member to know whether he or she is deliberating board business online or simply participating in healthy and robust discussions about the school system. So 
So again, language is just too vague to really be effectively implemented. If there's going to be a policy governing the use of social media and online pa platforms, it must be very clear. One of the potential consequences listed for violating this policy is being removed from committee assignments where board members do much of their work. So board members must be completely clear about what is being expected of them when such serious consequences are at stake. If I were a board member, I'd be very concerned about this policy as it is written now. It's too vague to be able to clearly identify when I was in compliance with the policy or not. And I'd always be concerned that something I'm saying on social media could be interpreted as being in violation of the policy. And this concern would likely limit my posts and my interactions online for fear of violating this nebulous policy. Social media and other online platforms are among the most common ways that people interact and debate current issues these days. If an overly broad and vague policy like this one leads to board members limiting their social media interactions, then it could have a significant negative impact on their engagement with the very stakeholders that they represent. So if the board does choose to go forward to have a social media policy, which I believe it will, it needs much clearer language so that all parties will know with certainty if and when violations occur. Um, so again, this policy is just too vague, and I'm grateful that it's been sent back to committee to be revised. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that ends our um, public comment on policies. The next. Not there. Pardon me. I yeah, understand. I'm sorry. Could you identify um, who was speaking? Oh, Miss Hen. Yes, Miss Hen. I believe there's somebody um, who has called in who signed up to speak to policies that has not been acknowledged. And how would you know this? Where did that, because I have a list here of everyone who signed up. Would you please um, check with Ms. Gover? Ms. Go Ms. Gover shaking her head. No, there is no one. There's, is there somebody online waiting? No. Or on the phone? Ms. Ms. Pfeiffer was the last one. Yeah, Ms. Um, Ms. Gover said Ms. Pfeiffer was the last one. Yeah, we just double check. All right, so the next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session. And for that, I call on Mr. Bursades. Good evening, Ms. Scott. Nothing to report from closed session. Thank you, Mr. Bursades. The next item on the agenda is the reopening of schools. And for that, I call on Dr. Williams. So good evening, uh, Chair Scott, Vice Chair Hen, and members of the Board of Education. Tonight, we, the design team and I, will provide an update regarding our reopening. Uh, we will discuss certain topics, such as a phase and approach, a data related to the virtual versus hybrid learning, extracurricular activities, CDC guidelines, an overview of our pacing and our partnership with our health experts or our health advisory. Next slide, please. Phase one and phase two began on March 1st. We had students attending public, our public separate day schools and our preschool through grade two. On March 15th, in grades three to 12, students receiving special education services provided primarily outside of general education had an opportunity to return in a hybrid model. Additionally, our high school students in select CTE programs returned so they could be afforded hands-on opportunities tied to credentialing. Once again, we need to highlight the work of our school-based staff servicing students and the collaboration that has taken place across schools and offices in order to welcome back our students. Our administrators had partner across schools within and across feeders to share best practices. Teachers volunteered to return early so they could explore and learn how to implement concurrent instruction. Office support staff worked tirelessly to assist with ensuring families with transportation information and that student information transferred into our new student information system. There have been incredible SEL supports provided to our students as they return. Teachers and paraeducators are implementing curriculum and meetings to reunite students as communities and our PPWs and social workers are assisting schools with outreach to our students and families. Our schools are fostering community partnerships to provide wraparound services to our families. Two schools have 
partnered with LEAF, the Latino Education Achievement Fund, to conduct workshops for our families regarding hybrid learning. Central office leaders participate in a Facebook Live session on Somos Baltimore Latinos and answered questions regarding hybrid learning. Yesterday, March 22nd, we had welcomed back all of our remaining staff to our schools. Our leaders, along with our office professionals and building service workers, have done a phenomenal job preparing for their return. Additionally, our sixth and ninth graders entered their middle and high schools for the first time this year. We are thrilled that we were able to offer them this week to be with staff and in their buildings ahead of the return of upper grades. Research has indicated how important it is to provide differentiated support to students in transitional years. Next slide, please. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Logan Washington at this time. Thank you, Dr. Williams. The graph displays um, the total percentage of students and families opting for in-person hybrid instruction and the percentage of students and family op families opting for virtual instruction district-wide in phases one and phase two. So you see the two percentages outlined on the slide with blue representing, the darker blue representing the, our students that are remaining virtual district-wide in phase one and phase two, and the lighter blue teal color representing our students that are opting for virtual. Next slide, please. This graph shows that same information, but by zone. So you have the east zone, central zone, and the west zone. Next slide, please. This graph shows the students returning in phases one and two by race. So you, the, one, the one graph displays the data with in-person hybrid learning and the other graph virtual learning. At this time, I'm going to pass the conversation to Ms. Byers, who will continue. So good evening, Chairwoman Scott and members of the board. Um, I want to begin by thanking Dr. Logan Washington for being us, uh, being with us this evening. Um, this data that has just been shared with you had previously been shared with our equity committee. Um, however, we felt it was really important to share it with the full board. And as Dr. Logan Washington explained, the data does reflect um, phases one and two. Um, Dr. Boswell McComas and Dr. Logan Washington do plan to share data for our subsequent phases uh, in future equity committee meetings. So we do want to just pause here for a moment, and my colleagues, Dr. Jones, Dr. Roberts, and I would just like to share how this data that's been presented compares to what we're seeing when we are in our schools. So um, as the community superintendent for the Central Zone, um, I can share that in my visits to my schools, the reality of what I'm witnessing in my schools is very much aligned to the data that you just looked at when we um, compare who has opted into a hybrid uh, learning pathway versus who has opted into a virtual learning pathway. Many of our Baltimore County public schools that are predominantly made up of white students have a large percentages of students whose families have opted into hybrid learning. Um, this is in contrast to what is observed in our schools that are not comprised of predominantly white students. At this time, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Jones to share a little bit about what she has seen as the community superintendent in the West Zone. Thank you, Ms. Byers, and good, good evening. These data in the pandemic itself have created another opportunity to listen, learn, and respond to what is actually happening in the Lansdowne area, Weston Tech, Catonsville, Woodlawn, Milford Mill area, and within the Randallstown and Newtown communities. Those communities at large represent our West Zone. As I visit schools and speak to principals and teachers and support staff in the West Zone, I hear the anecdotes. Tragic losses during the coronavirus pandemic that understandably have impacted current choices. 
To that end, as West Zone leaders, we will not alienate our black and brown families. We will not judge, ignore, or overlook families that also deserve a high quality education. We must value the decisions of the families that remain in remote learning in a remote learning environment as much as we value those that choose to participate in in-person learning. Every student, every family, every school community matters. Again, the West Zone data is compelling. Principals, teachers, and staff, thank you for your continued advocacy. We will remain focused on our moral imperative and obligation to provide a high quality education to all students, virtual and in-person. Our data tells us that we have to do that. Virtual and in-person learning is going to be important in our reopening discussions and in our reopening planning moving forward. I'll turn it over to now to Dr. Roberts. Dr. Roberts. Great, thank you, Dr. Jones, and good evening, board members and Dr. Williams. I wanted to really focus my comments on our, um, as you re heard reference earlier for some of our community stakeholders on our Latino students, um, particularly in the Southeast area. So as the East Zone Community Superintendent, um, my zone of schools encompasses from Perry Hall South um, through Essex into Dundalk and in Edgemere and a growing population of our Latino students and um, are in these areas. So when talking with my principals in the East Zone, one of the things that they are doing in the work, the critical work that they're doing is reaching out um, to this particular community to assess their needs and assess their wants in terms of a virtual and or an in-person environment. And what we're hearing from this community, not just from the parents sharing with with their principals, but in opportunities that I've had and others like Dr. Basra McComas and others of us have spoken directly with community members um, in our Latino community is they have concerns. They have concerns around um, not the safety of their children within the school, but in the community, the community spread and wanting to keep their children virtual um, for a little bit longer. So with that, our principals are focused on providing, as Dr. Jones mentioned, really a high quality education virtual education for our students as well as an in-person education for our students because the impact on our black and brown students um, is real in terms of their willingness to come back um, and working with our schools to do so. So we wanted to just reiterate these points and, and add some context to these slides for the board and for the community. So at this point, I'll turn it back over to Mrs. Byers um, with some concluding comments and to move forward in the presentation. So thank you, Dr. Roberts. Um, I would like to conclude this portion of our update by just providing some additional important context to these data that echoes some of what you've already heard this evening from our stakeholders. Um, our principals across all of our 175 school centers and programs have done an incredible job of outreach to their families in order to ascertain the choices of our families. They've worked collaboratively with our PPWs, our social workers, our um, ESOL office, and translators to reach our families. They've hosted countless parent evenings. They've um, used technology to provide information and to inform their parents of what return in a hybrid setting could look like. They've also even done individual Facebook live tours with families. I share all of that because it is important to note that this data reflects the informed choices of our families. Students and families who are opting into a virtual pathway are doing so based on information that they have received and for reasons that reflect what is in the best interest of the student and the family. As Dr. Jones explained, that choice is and it will continue to be respected by our staff inside and outside of the schoolhouse. And that respect is reflected in our ongoing plans. At this time, we are going to continue with our re-entry update and we are going to um, shift gears a little bit to um, talk about our students. So uh, Mr. Corns, if you could please advance to the next slide. So we do want to um, provide an update on in-person um, extracurricular activities. 
Um, the full board received information today, as did our principals. Um, as you are all aware, our extracurricular activities include both programs and clubs that enhance our students' academic program. Um, BCPS provides these extracurricular activities in all of our elementary, our middle, and our high schools. So examples of our clubs include the chess club, our student government associations, robotics, and then we also have programs like our honor societies, performing arts groups, and fine arts groups. It is important to note that all of these activities have taken place in our schools since the beginning of the school year in a virtual environment. Our teachers, our staff, our paraprofessionals who sponsor these activities have done a remarkable job engaging students in the virtual setting, and they've been incredibly creative. I, um, I've had the privilege of attending virtual plays, virtual performances, virtual art shows. So I just want to commend the job and the creativity of our staff. Our students will have the opportunity to participate in these activities in an in-person setting beginning on April 12th. Um, after we've received input from our school-based leaders, we did recognize that this timeline will allow our teachers and our support staff who sponsor these activities, as well as our students, to be able to become reacclimated to um, the in-person environment. If a teacher or a parent educator or a staff member cannot sponsor an activity in a face-to-face -face setting, our school leaders will have the opportunity and the flexibility to explore alternatives and to make adjustments accordingly. Virtual extracurriculars have enabled students to stay connected to their school communities since the fall. Consequently, our in-person activities will be offered in a concurrent learning model so that our students who have opted to remain virtual for very good reasons may still participate. We want to ensure that we are servicing all of our students and not creating greater gaps between our white students and our students of color. Finally, staff, in consultation with our high school leaders and the Office of Health Services, will be providing a plan and, gu and a guidance document that is related to senior activities. Um, this plan and guidance document will be shared with our principals this week. So speaking of our seniors, at this time, I would um, ask Mr. Corns to advance the slide, and I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Zarchin, who will provide an update on graduation. Dr. Zarchin. Thank you, Ms. Byers. Staff continue to plan for modified in-person graduation ceremonies, information regarding proposed venues and details about health and safety protocols are forthcoming. We are currently waiting for a decision from Towson University regarding the availability of SECU arena in the event that the Towson SECU arena is not available, a work group is exploring alternative outdoor venues across Baltimore County. Health and safety considerations, both CDC and local, will guide our plans for modified ceremonies. Next slide, please. So last Friday, the CDC released up updated guidance. Um, as you can see, there are some changes. We've moved to three feet of social distancing in classrooms in our elementary schools or in elementary schools is the guidance uh, where mask use is universal regardless of community transmission. The guidance provided by CDC uh, shares that middle and high schools where mask use is universal unless community transmission is high and unless students and teachers change classes. Six feet of social distancing remains in the guidance between adults in common areas, including during meals, outside of the classroom, and increased uh, exaltation, the signing bands and sports, um, where, where they're, they're more active, the breathing may be uh, more vigorous, uh, that is still six feet of social distancing. 
So our secondary students changed classes so we would not be able to adopt the three feet of social distancing in middle and high schools. We expect the Maryland Department of Health and the Maryland State Department of Education to review this guidance in upcoming weeks. Currently, Maryland requires schools to provide six feet of social distancing to the extent possible. The CDC core principles for social distancing between students in classrooms includes elementary schools. As I mentioned earlier, students should be at least three feet apart. Uh, the guidance, as I mentioned, in middle and high schools uh, can be three feet in areas of low, moderate, or substantial community transmission. In areas of high community transmission, middle and high school students should be six feet apart if cohorting is not possible. As I mentioned earlier, our students uh, change classes in middle school and high school, so that cohorting is not in place. Uh, next slide, please. As we chart our path for our return to full in-person learning, we will gradually add additional layers of groups and activities in a thoughtful way all along providing safety for students and staff while making progress towards the resumption of full in-person learning. This approach mirrors the layered approach we use with the mitigation strategies. At this time, many unknowns remain on the path. With the vi virus levels remaining high, will they remain stable or drop in the next few weeks? Another question is, will the state sanction CDC guideline, guidelines on social distancing in school? We have yet to see that. What we are showing here is a roadmap for the next few months that will move us towards full in-person learning. You can see that in April, two things will be happening. Each week, we will add a new group, new programming, and a higher risk activity all the while maintaining strict mitigation measures and monitoring for spread. We expect that we will see minimum tran minimal transmission of COVID in schools, and that will be safely expanded as far as programming for students in the hybrid environment. Next, as we look towards May, we will seek to increase the number of days that students will be in school. We will begin with our elementary learners in accordance with what we know about lowest spread for this group, with the target of elementary students being able to attend four days a week by early May. We have some additional operational challenges to address in April. For example, what is the impact of the increased elementary class size on transportation? How will we provide the recommended six feet of social distancing during lunch and when students are not masked. Our design team operations work group has been assigned the task of providing recommended strategies and solutions for these issues. Next slide, please. The timeline to provide all students with the opportunity to return to in-person learning enables us to learn what's working and identify variables that need to be addressed as we increase the number of students in schools. That learning process and the evaluation along the way is incredibly important. We are purposely being conservative as transmission rates have been rising so we can build on successes and strengthen confidence and trust across stakeholders. We are both energized and excited about progress towards having students back in schools five days a week. And we understand that we will need to address those who are ready for a full return now and those who are uncomfortable about the risks associated with the path we are currently on. We believe that our current path will build trust and confidence in our return to in-person learning. In a meeting with the CDC senior scientist and epidemiologist, we received positive feedback on a return to in-person learning. 
In the meeting, we were encouraged to walk, then run, and avoid putting the, the cart before the horse, which would leave us forced to re revert back. The CDC doctor encouraged us to maintain a deliberate pace. Yesterday, in our second meeting with our health advisory experts from Johns Hopkins and the University of Maryland, we had an opportunity to share our plan and receive guidance on our plan and pace towards a full return to in-person learning. In the meeting, it was reinforced that with cohorts, we can put more students back in schools. Once again, we were encouraged to continue moving towards bringing more students back at a purposeful pace while monitoring transmission in schools. A key takeaway from the meeting was to move with a focus on quality improvement. We were encouraged to monitor variables as we expand in-person learning and avoid moving at a pace that would prevent us from having to walk back our return. That would happen or could happen if our pace exceeds our ability to learn and adapt to challenges. The JHU and University of Maryland doctors emphasize that the risk of secondary transmission increases with age. As a result, we will focus our early expansion for elementary schools and then include middle schools and high schools. We will continue to monitor our metrics and build upon our mitigation practices as we deliberately and safely progress towards a return to in-person learning for all five days a week. It is our goal to be fully open and keep the schools fully open. To that end, we are committed to building on successes and learning so students receive the benefits of in-person learning without disruptions or returns back to virtual. Next slide, please. So we are extremely thankful for the guidance and support that we have received from local and national experts. Our most recent advisors are working with us to support the school system as a res result of the Baltimore County government's involvement and partnership with our work. Experts in our health advisory are from the Johns Hopkins Consortium for Schools-Based Health and the University of Maryland School of Medicine. We have continued to work with Dr. Branch on a week, at least a weekly basis, and we are regularly in contact with him about many issues that come up and opportunities for vaccines for our staff throughout BCPS. We also have a COVID task force that meets weekly that includes Dr. Chen uh, from the Department of Health in Baltimore County. Our design team and work groups continue to focus on opportunities to expand in-person learning. And as I mentioned, uh, our new advisory health group has been a great asset as well. Dr. Williams in his weekly meetings with superintendents Here's from the Maryland Department of Health, as well as MSDE. At this time, I will turn to Dr. McComas uh, to continue the presentation. Good evening, members of the board. Uh, Mr. Corns, if you could please advance the slide. I'm here to uh, provide you a, a, just a reiteration of our update for athletics. As all of you know by now, we have expanded our spectators uh, for our athletic games. It's um, typically three spectators per student athlete. Um, and of course, um, that can take us up to crowds, uh, approximately 360 uh, persons or so. Um, we certainly need to make adjustments for older and smaller facilities that um, may not accommodate uh, such large crowds, keeping in mind that spectators still need to maintain six feet distance uh, between uh, the groups um, that 
are there. Um, and we are continuing to use our paperless ticketing system, Ticket Spicket, as a way of helping to uh, manage that as well as to support us if and when contact tracing uh, is necessary. Um, again, safety protocols remain in effect, as Dr. Zarchin talked about, wearing masks, maintaining social uh, six feet social distancing, and of course, contact tracing as referenced. Mr. Corns, if you could go on to the next slide. I'm happy to share with you this evening, um, moving forward. Uh, I know Dr. Zarchin talked with you about our, our journey um, moving forward into the rest of the school year. And I'm here to share with you some of our highlights of this upcoming summer's learning program. We are pleased to offer this summer um, a combination of both in-person or face-to-face -face learning opportunities, as well as virtual synchronous instruction for students. And uh, paired also with a self-paced, fully virtual option for students as well. Um, our in-person uh, programs that will be offered both in-person and synchronously virtually are our Bridge to Kindergarten program, which is a brand new program this year, um, thanks to a state grant. Uh, and this is an in-person only opportunity for our students who will be entering kindergarten. Uh, we will, um, as always, we always offer the extended year program, which is for students whose IEP um, um, require them to have the extended year learning program. Again, this will be offered um, in person extended learning opportunity for our Title I schools, um, our English language learners. These programs um, prioritize our English language learners who are level one and level two speakers. Uh, our extended year learning program, which services students at the middle grades and um, students at the high school grades as well. Our math academy, and for students who participate in the early college access program, uh, that's a magnet program at Woodlawn High School, those students will have a virtual summer program um, in which they are taking coursework with CCBC. Lastly, uh, we will also offer again this summer what we refer to as the lear Summer Learning Hike. This was a new program that we offered last year that began the very first week that school closed and ran all the way through to the very last week prior to school starting this year. This um, program uh, is offered for students uh, that will be um, in grades K to 12 for next school year. It is entirely optional. Students can drop in. Uh, this is self-paced and they work through uh, the programs um, as, at the convenience of themselves and their family. Uh, they can take a week off, they can jump back in and work through it uh, in, again, a self-paced manner. Uh, we did see last year great participation in the summer learning hike. I think particularly our third graders last year used it a great deal throughout the summer. Uh, so we are excited to offer that again this summer. Our intent was to provide a robust bridge that spanned this year into next school year and to provide um, the learning in the formats that we believe would serve our community well for those families that uh, want to remain virtual. We're offering um, much of what we're doing in a virtual format for those families that want and prefer the face-to-face um, -face or in-person instruction. We're very pleased to be able to offer that again this summer. Uh, and. At that, I believe I conclude the presentation. I think, Mr. Corns, could you go to the next slide? Thank you. And at this point, um, I will turn it back over to Dr. Williams. Thank you. So thank so you, thank team, you for, for giving an update. I will then turn it to Chair Scott. Thank you. Um, so um, we can start taking questions. That looks like our first one is from Mr. Offerman. Yes, uh, first of all, thank everyone. It was a extremely well done presentation. I'd like to focus back on the middle and the high school uh, situation. Is it correct to say that what's standing in our way to bringing those students back uh, in larger numbers or for more days is the fact that they uh, that they are, are uh, changing classes? Is, is that the is that the uh, is that the primary problem? Well, that will come into play if, if MSDE and the Maryland Department of Health, if when they adopt the new CDC guidelines. Um, at this point, they have not been adopted. Uh, with, with what we have with our 
percent positivity at this point. Um, you were in that high transmission area, and it, it, it's really difficult when you add that to the fact that they are not cohorting, they're moving from class to class. So it, to your point, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Next is Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, Dr. Zarchin, is your area in charge of the procurement of PPE for schools? So no. we work on part of that with facilities. It depends on on, on the PPP, PPE um, that's desired. So just to clarify, you work in conjunction with facilities to tell them what would be needed in the schools so that's all available, correct? Yes, and I, and I can have uh, Dr. Scriven and um, Ms. Somerville speak to details about that, um, but we do work together on ordering, yes. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Um, when you were talking about the schedule, um, you were talking about May, June, continued expansion of in-person learning. Are you talking about, you're talking about four day a week, but you only mentioned elementary schools. Are you, are you ex expecting it to just stop at elementary schools? No, we will start with elementary schools. As I mentioned, one of the critical areas that we're, we're looking at is as, as we introduce new variables, bringing more students in, we're monitoring lunch, time outside of the building. We hope to expand beyond elementary, but what the research is saying is that, and, and our experts, the spread is lowest with our elementary age students. So as we expand, that's where we will start. And just so I'm clear, you, you're not able to move forward any faster in April because of why? I'm not sure your question. I don't. You, yeah, you said specific. you're waiting until May to make the expansion. My question is, why are you waiting on all the way until May? Because of monitoring metrics, making sure that as we're still transitioning students back, um, learning from not only situations in school that have arised, but also athletics. So that's, that's that safe pace to a return and, and moving at a pace where we can learn along the way and be very careful that we don't get in a situation where we go too fast. We have positive cases that send students or cohorts back home um, because of spread. So uh, could you just explain in order for us to expand uh, to four days, um, what metrics do you need to see in order to agree to that? So the one metric we're looking at right now is or two actually, total cases per 100,000 based on a seven day and percent positivity based on a seven day. So right now, in addition to that, and this may be even more important, it's learning from our positive cases that occur in schools. And, and that's, that's really critical. Where are we doing a good job with our, our protocols, our mitigation practices, and, and where are we, we, we struggling a little bit? But the other piece is, as, as we have returned, the, the tracking of cases that our nurses are doing, um, it requires a great deal of time. Um, contact tracing for one positive can, can lead to many, many interviews with students and staff. So those are things that we're learning to grow with. We're getting better at it, um, but it is taking time and it is really stretching 
our, our, our nursing staff pretty thin right now. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zarch, and I'll reserve the rest of my time. Thank you. I, I think one thing that may be helpful is having Ms. Somerville talk about the work of contact tracing. I think that's an area that is not always understood, um, you know, the, the time, effort, energy, and resources that go into that. Uh, Ms. Somerville, could you give us a quick overview of that contact tracing work? Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I was double muted. Um, so, the, so in Baltimore County Schools, we're doing a targeted contact tracing. There's places that um, are just sending whole pods or classrooms home when there's a case. And we feel like it's important to um, make sure that we identify persons with close contact and then notify those persons personally that they had an exposure to COVID. Um, so we interview the case. And in, if the case isn't a student, we have to interview the teacher because very rarely will parents know in the classroom um, who the student was in close contact with. We also have to touch base with the bus driver and look at the bus seating arrangements and, um, and notify all staff as well. Um, so what we find is using that targeted approach, which minimizes exclusion, you use that whole class goes home for two weeks, it works. But it, um, it is really kind of using a sledgehammer when, um, when a screwdriver will work. Um, but it really, we, that, that takes a significant amount of time to do well and to provide the support to our parents and our staff that they need when they learn that they've been exposed to COVID. We link them to testing resources. We provide them information and, um, you know, for our staff information about leave and working remotely. So that's, in a nutshell, the contact tracing. And I'd like to just add one thing that we're monitoring very closely is the concept of secondary spread, which is our goal is no transmission in school. And so we're really monitoring, um, monitoring the people that we put out as close contacts and the schools where we have cases to make sure that we do not have secondary spread. And if we do, what we can do to mitigate that, because we really need to gain the, keep our students and staff safe and to gain the trust of our community that we can open and operate safely during a pandemic. Thank you for that. Next we have Dr. Hager. Yes, thank you so much, Ms. Somerville, and thank you to those of you who did the presentation for your transparency with all the return to school data. Um, and thanks for assembling these great health advisors. And it's just, I'm really excited about where we are right now. And I, given our current positivity rate, I actually really appreciate the pace that we're going with. And I think that we're in, um, again, in a really good position. And I thank you all for all your hard work. Um, so my questions are really more looking forward a little bit. Um, so April 27th happens to be my birthday, and it also happens to be the day that 16-year-olds in Maryland are allowed to get vaccinated. So given that, are we, do we have a plan in place to um, track our students that are going to be vaccinated um, like we would with any vaccine, just so we can start to understand kind of how widespread these vaccines are? I'm also hopeful that this summer, um, summer young, uh, younger children will be allowed to get vaccinated. Can everyone mute, please? Everyone mute, please. Um, so basically, do we, what do we have in place to prepare? Because that is right around the corner. Thank you for that question. So I'll start with the tracking um, who's been vaccinated. Um, that is very difficult because of privacy. Um, we have been asked, you know, how many of our employees have received the vaccine and we really, we can share how many you know, links we can offer. Um, but beyond that, it's very difficult um, to, to have a sense of how many employees have received the vaccine uh, because of those privacy issues. Uh, I think the same will hold true with our students. What we do have a sense in with our employees now is that we have fewer and fewer who are reaching out for the vaccines when we have availability. And, and the other piece is we don't know who's gone beyond uh, the clinics that we've offered in coordination with Baltimore County Department of Health.
That is really interesting. So um, would it require something from the Department of Health to add the COVID vaccine to some sort of a vaccine list for students or is that unlikely to happen? So good evening, Dr. Hager. I, I'll let Ms. Somerville um, jump in if I am incorrect, but Comar dictates required vaccinations for students, I believe. This is Ms. Somerville. Um, Comar does dictate those immunizations, but our, um, our weekly downloads of data from Maryland Immunet include required and non-required vaccines. So we actually will get that data as part of our data sharing agreement with Maryland Immunet. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and then what, um, is there a time, is there a plan in place for a timeline for when we will release our fall plans? So I'll start. Um, as Dr. McComas shared, the bridge between the spring and the summer is what we're working on. And if the metrics are looking favorable uh, with all the information and guidance that we receive, I don't see why we wouldn't start. Uh, again, if the metrics are looking favorable and we have the guidance through all of our partners, CDC, of course, the, the Maryland Health Department and MSDE. Um, principals are already looking at staffing. So we are anticipating, um, I, don't, I can't say a normal start, but we're anticipating starting a school year um, that we, similar to other school years. But at this point, as Dr. Zarchin was sharing, we're gonna to continue to monitor those guidelines and see if anything may change. As you all know, last year, uh, we had to submit a plan in June, and I think we got feedback in July. Uh, so uh, we'll continue to provide some updates once we have received. But yes, the way I'm looking at it, if everything is aligned, we are planning for, um, try to be somewhat of a traditional start of a school year, if you will. Thank you, that's all for now. Thank you, uh, it's like Ms. Mack. Yes, thank you, uh, Ms. Scott. I, I think this question may tie into um, what Dr. Williams just referenced as the bridge between spring and summer. Yesterday, the state superintendent, Karen Salmon, sent out a memo with some attachments with the subject of second tier performance metrics. And um, it appears that BCPS, I, I, I believe all systems were asked to provide data on the fall 2020 um, semester. And it looks like BCPS reported that seventh graders received 24.3 hours per week of synchronous learning. A parent emailed me and perhaps other board members, I think yesterday, that her child had only received 14 hours a week of synchronous learning. It, can anybody explain how there could be a discrepancy? Um, and if there is a discrepancy, what we're doing now to make sure that kids really do get the 24 um, hours a week? Sure, Ms. Mack, I'm happy to uh, speak to that. Um, what you'll see in that question for the second term performance was that the, the instructional model hours, um, and that includes the small group hours on Wednesday morning. And those small groups are, um, they fluctuate and they're customized by teacher, by subject, by grade level uh, to service students. So those small groups are designed to they can be used for students that need additional intervention. They can be used for students that need acceleration. And so that's really what that model uh, that took into that account that. Um, and so that's where you may experience uh, variation and fluctuations. So thank you, Dr. McComas, very much. When we submitted our hours, did we extrapolate based on who we thought was attending on Wednesdays or who could attend or who actually attended? Now, the model, what was submitted is what the model is, which is the universal model. And then the way that gets implemented is where you get the nuances. So in this case, where this mom is reporting that her son only got 14 hours, would it be safe to say that this child may not have participated in Wednesday learning? That's possible. I don't know the particular, you know, um, 
child's schedule and when or what they may or may not have had that opportunity. And one more quick question about that, and I know we've talked about it, but is that totally up to the student to participate in the um, Wednesday learning? Well, it's, it's really organized. You need to think about Wednesdays. And like instructionally, what we think about Wednesdays is where, um, and Ms. Mack, I know you visit classrooms as many of our um, board members do, which we appreciate. Um, it, you know, in the normal setting, you would see the teacher pull that small group and they might work with a small group for 20, 30 minutes. Then they, they would have those students maybe move on to some independent work and pull another group. Um, and so those Wednesday mornings were really designed to have that kind of flexibility so that that we could provide really focused, targeted support for students, um, and that that was not just limited to intervention, students that need to uh, get caught up, but that that could also be used for students to have enrichment acceleration. And so I hope that you can understand how there is variance in the way that becomes implemented. Well, we would not turn a student away who wanted to participate on Wednesday learning. I no, but I would say that that's, uh, it is structured and organized by the classroom teacher, how they utilize that time. All right. But thank you very much, Dr. McComas. My pleasure as always. Thank you. Thank you. Looks like we have a question from Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, Dr. McComas. I had a follow-up question regarding Wednesday instruction to Ms. Mack's questions. Yes. Are, are we tracking on a student level? those instructional hours? So that would be that the classroom teachers would, uh, I do not at the system level um, have have a, a system for tracking that because that fluctuates classroom by classroom. Thank you. Are teachers required to track it? I, I would say that that would just be part of their instructional planning for the week. So is that a yes or no? As a principal, I would expect my teachers to be able to share how that time is used. Are principals required to report it at a system level? No, we do not have a system level reporting mechanism for that. So to Ms. Mack's point, she asked about extrapolation for the data that was sent to MSDE. That assumes that all students are receiving the 24 and a half hours um, of synchronous instruction per week. Yes, and the um, models that were put forward to MSDE um, way back in the fall, that was part of what this model uh, puts forward, talks about the average of the hours. So is it expected that within the, the six hours on Wednesday that all students would have synchronous contact or synchronous instruction during those? Yeah, that, that is really for customized group work. And so that can fluctuate. You may have a student who has it one week um, and a student that doesn't have it necessarily the next week, depending upon how the teacher is using their small group structures. Because what I'm hearing is that students are not receiving that synchronous instruction on Wednesdays and that that's the norm rather than the exception. So I'm asking about tracking so that I have some data when we hear these things anecdotally to be able to um, validate or, you know, invalidate what we're hearing. Sure. So, Ms. I Hen, I'm sorry. Ms. Hen, I would suggest you, that you would share that information with me or with Ms. of Dr. McComas if you're hearing such reports. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Mr. Kuhn. Well, thanks, Ms. Scott. I have a motion, and it's, um, I'll just read it. I move to direct the Office of Internal Audit to immediately begin an audit of the Education and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund of $23.7 million that was awarded to BCPS through the CARES Act grant on June 26th of 2020. The also, the Office of Internal Audit will provide their final report at the June 8, 2021 Board of Education meeting. Is there a second? Second, Hen. 
Thank you. So um, Mr. Kuhn made a motion to direct the Office of Internal Audit to immediately begin an audit of the Education and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund of $23.7 million that was awarded to BCPS through the CARES Act grant on June 26, 2020. The OIA will provide their financial report at the June 8, 2021 Board of Education meeting, and that was seconded by Ms. Hen. Um, would you like to speak to your motion? I'll speak briefly to it. Um, Everybody is very interested in the amount of money uh, that has come to the school system. And this is just the first part. This is known as CARES Act 1, or people refer to it as CARES Act 1. So I'm talking about the initial amount of money. There's a CARES Act 2, and and that will be <laughs> a separate discussion as as that money is um, as a focus of future meetings. Um, and, and of future plans. Uh, but this motion is specifically to say, this is what we've spent the money on. Here are the things that we bought for that uh, so that it can be made public um, as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Any questions? Okay, Ms. Gover, if we could do a roll call vote, please. Oh, I apologize, excuse me, <laughs> Mr. McMillian. Yeah, in conversation with Ms. Barr, and for those that, that are unaware, I'm re excuse me? Your microphone's not on. If the light's on. Hey. No, they had me turn down low for some, so, because I'm loud. Uh, for those of the, that don't know, I'm on the, I'm the chairman of the Internal Audit Committee. And in conversation with Ms. Barr, there's a possibility that the CLA and external audit group is looking at these expenditures. So my argument would be why, if, if, if we get an answer that they're doing that, why are we gonna duplicate their work? To me, that's not working smart, smartly. So, now, if they're not doing that, yes, that's something that the audit committee can look at. But I, th I think that, you know, we've got committees to look at things. Why throw something out there? Let the committee look at it. If the committee justifies it, and I'm a transparent guy, if, if that's something the committee wants to do, if the committee says, no, they don't want to do it, we come back to the board, and then we vote on it if the outside audit is not doing this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. It looks like there was a comment uh, first from Mr. Kuhn and then Ms. Causey. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, thanks, Mr. McMillian. I appreciate your insight and your comments. Um, having been the chair of the audit committee for nearly two years, I understand how it works. Um, and uh, one of the things that I would point out is that we have set aside hours uh, for the Office of Internal Audit to um, execute on board-directed projects. Um, and this would be a board-directed project, so the hours should be in the budget and should be available. And we're getting close to the end of the fiscal year, so I believe we have the ability to do that. The other point that I would like to make is um, I don't know what the CLA audit's going to cover or when is actually going to happen. but this is a very timely audit and i believe and that's the reason why i set a june 8th date for the report to be due was to provide the information to the public as soon as possible um, and i believe all the information should be available and dr williams and his team will make that all very available to the office of internal audit and therefore we'll have um at least cares act one uh you know provided to everybody thank you thank you mr cone Ms. Causey and then um, Mr. McMillian again. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I appreciate Mr. McMillian as chair of the audit committee uh, discussing his perspective on the um, use of Clifton Larson uh, as the outside auditor, they're the uh, typical outside auditor um, to do the work. And I would support the motion um, as uh, as presented, and if the Office of Internal Audit 
decides to util utilize Clifton Larson uh, to get the work done, then that would be up to the chief auditor to do so. I think it is helpful for the full board to have its um, opinion known about what's important. Um, so I would, uh, I would support the motion and also support uh, these types of motions in terms of having the full board to express their opinion about what's important and also to the timeliness of it. Um, thank you. Thank you. Mr. McMillian, then Ms. Rowe. Uh, Dr. Williams, can we have Chief Auditor Barr speak to this if she's available? I'm happy to see if uh, Ms. Barr is on the line. I will just remind the board we've shared um, how we've used the CARES One Act. We've shared it in a weekly update, and we're happy to share it again with the board and some of the ideas that we plan to use with the CARES too. Um, so I don't know if Ms. Barr is on the line. While you check, perhaps we could go to Ms. Rowe. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I think the issue is less about has the, has the expenditures been shared with the board so much as are these expenditures be share, being shared in a detailed format with the public? And if the auditors are looking into this, then that just means that they're going to verify the numbers. I see no reason why the Office of Internal Audit cannot ask for the information and supply a report that's available to the public and then the external auditors will do what they do and confirm that the information is accurate. And Mr. Kuhn is right in that that external audit could take a lot longer. And we're getting a lot of scrutiny on people wanting to know precisely how the CARES Act money was spent. And if we don't offer accountability for how the first amount was spent, then there's just going to be constant questions about future amounts. And so I think that uh, I think that we should do this. Thank you. We have a question uh, from Dr. Hager. Um, yeah, I had a question for, for Mr. McMillian and for Mr. Kuhn. Um, so, Mr. McMillian, when would this audit be available and would it automatically be made public, the one that you're referring to? Ms. Barr's in contact with a woman named Ch Cherry King, and she respond, She emailed her here 15 or 20 minutes ago. She won't know the, the details of what they're looking at until tomorrow morning. Okay. And then, um, Mr. Kuhn, why, why do you feel this is so urgent that we, we can't wait for the audit that Mr. McMillian is referring to? So we're talking about significant amount of funds and our understanding is, is what's been reported to um, the board is that, you know, this money's been spent um, waiting. I, I, I honestly don't. So he, we're referring to the single audit that happens every year. It's an annual thing that happens where an outside auditor comes in and makes sure that we're spending money appropriately throughout the entire system. So, um, I'm not quite sure the timing. Um, I'm sure that um, uh, perhaps some staff could speak to the timing. I, I don't recall it off the top of my head. Uh, but I, what I'm seeing is we're getting close to the end of the fiscal year. I know that there's um, this is this is a, a large dollar item, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, and I think that the Office of Internal Audit could focus on it and do it. Um, in this relatively short amount of time. I have faith in them. I, mean, I just add that I, we've had updates almost weekly on how the money has been spent. Um, and so it would surprise me if an auditor found something different, you know, because it's been so transparent. So, um, so yeah, that's just my own perspective. Oh. Trust but verify. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. Um, Ms. Barr just joined us. Um, Ms. Barr, are you there? Yes. Good evening. Good evening, Ms. Barr. Thank you for joining us. Um, Mr. McMillian, um, you had a question of Ms. Barr, or you wanted her to speak to the motion proposed? Yes, if she would speak to this, please. Okay. So let me, um, 
Uh, let me restate the motion for you, Ms. Barr, because um, I think she's phoning in and, and can't see the chat. So um, Mr. Kuhn made a motion to direct the Office of Internal Audit to immediately begin an audit of the Education and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund of $23.7 million that was awarded to BCPS through the CARES Act grant on June 26, 2020. The OIA will provide their final report at the June 8, 2021 Board of Education meeting. So Mr. Um, McMillian um, asked, and I think it would be helpful for all of us um, if you could speak to that motion. Um, it particularly, is that something that your office is already doing? Would this work be redundant or repetitive, or is this something that's um, already being undertaken? Okay, I, I do apologize. I lost power. I was watching the meeting, and, and I missed the, the conversation um, about, I caught the tail end about the conversation about the single audit. The um, board's external auditors, Clifton Larson Allen, typically do the audit related to federal expenditures. And at the audit committee back in October, Ms. Sherry King, who is the partner, um, on, on the uh, job for the board expressed that they would be reviewing these expenditures as part of the single audit in this upcoming year. So in order to avoid or eliminate redundancy, um, I wanted to check with her first to make sure, first of all, that they were going to include that as part of their single audit process this year. If not, then of course there would be things that we could do in relation to um, looking at those expenditures. <clears throat> Excuse me, but as part of the single audit, um, there's typically a compliance supplement that is issued related to particular areas of funding. For example, special education, Title I, there would be uh, that same thing issued with related to the CARES funding um, monies. And so there would be particular things that they would be looking for related to these expenditures to make sure that the expenditures were made in compliance with all federal regulations and expectations and that the expenditures were allowable. So I'm not sure when the motion indicates that they want us to audit these expenditures specifically, what would it be that we would be looking for other than those two things? I would seek clarification to the motion. Thank you for that, Ms. Barr. It looks like there's a comment and an amendment from Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, and thank you, Ms. Barr, for joining us and for your comments. Um, I agree that um, the board would have to define the scope of the audit that Mr. Kuhn has proposed. Therefore, I'd like to um, offer the following amendment. I'd like to amend the motion on the floor by inserting the statement, the scope of the audit will be determined by the board audit committee um, so that Mr. McMillian as chair of the audit committee can oversee that on behalf of the committee and that it can be further clarified and to ensure that the work is not redundant. And if I may speak to, um, continue to speak to this, Madam Chair. Um, well, so you uh, made a... Uh, motion to add to the um, you made a motion to add an amendment does that require a second second row okay thank you so what uh, Ms. Hen amended it is to add the scope of the audit will be determined by the board audit committee okay and it was seconded by Ms. Rowe yes Ms. Hen you may speak to your motion or your thank amendment you. thank you and thank you to Ms. Barr for um, speaking to the, the scope of the external audit, that it does include federal funding. However, this is but one small piece of what an external audit looks at. Um, the, the focus I see and the depth to which this internal audit would go would be far different. Um, an external audit always looks at small samples. Um, and even given that, the fact that this is a small piece of their work um, in contrary to what internal audit could do, which would be a much deeper dive. And again, as defined by the scope determined by the audit committee, I would look to our audit committee to determine exactly what that scope is. I don't see the two as mutually exclusive. I think this would give the board and the public 
the confidence that um, we require to understand these expenditures. And I appreciate Dr. Williams' transparency in providing this information to the board through the weekly updates. However, the public also needs to have this information at the ready. So I would want to share this report with the public and I support um, having it presented at the June 8th meeting. Thank you. Thank you. It looks like there is a comment from Ms. Causey on uh, Ms. Hen's amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would support Ms. Hen's amendment, and I would just um, ask the um, uh, I would just ask the uh, audit committee chair to consider, in addition to the specific amount um, indicated by Mr. Kuhn, uh, to also evaluate the scope, as Ms. Hen said, uh, coronavirus relief fund for technology, which I'm not sure is that 12 million, uh, the coronavirus relief fund for tutoring. I think that might be another 12 million um, and the GEER K-12 technology. So in terms of what um, the scope may be, I would just ask them to consider that and I will be supporting her amendment. Thank you. And it looks like um, Ms. Rowe. Oh, so I had questions for Ms. Barr that aren't necessarily um, in the process. Oh, on the amendment. The okay. amendment. Oh, okay but, then. I mean, I can ask them now if you want. Uh, no, I thought your question was on, on um, for Ms. Barr on the amendment. So um, No, it was on the general motion. Okay, so if we could process the amendment, and then, um, then we can go back to the motion. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Um, Gover, if we could take a roll call vote for Ms. Hen's amendment to the motion. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pestcher? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So that was for the amendment. Now um, we're back on the motion itself. And um, Ms. Rowe, you have a question about the motion. Yes, I had um, a couple questions from Ms. Barr. Uh, can you tell um, me when the external audit is expected to be finished and if the results of that audit uh, would be made public and um, if, if they audit the CARES Act funding, are they taking samples or are they auditing everything or is there a level of materiality? Can you explain those questions, please? Sure. So um, by law, they have to complete the CAFR by September 30 and that report is public and the single audit by December 31 and that report is public. In the past, they have completed both reports, the CAFR and the single audit, by September 30. Due to the COVID pandemic, however, this year, um, that deadline for the single audit was extended, I believe, until um, March of this year. So it was a little bit different um, due to the COVID pandemic. Both reports are public. They've always been posted on the board's website. I don't know if they've been restored yet um, due to the ransomware attack, but the information is public information. Uh, with respect to their approach, um, I believe, Ms. Rowe, as you'll recall, when you were the chair of the audit committee, that was explained with respect to uh, materiality with, with regard to the reporting of their findings. They do select samples, but again, it's uh, proprietary information uh, for the company with respect to how they select those samples and how materiality is determined. Okay, so Ms. Barr, is it accurate to say that if the Office of Internal Audit did an audit of these CARES Act expenditures and had it done by June, that, you, that if there were problems that, or um, findings that you had, that you could have corrective actions in place for future upcoming CARES Act funding, of which we're expending substantial amounts, um, well before we even get the CAFR? If the due date was June 8th, that's a correct statement, yes. 
Thank you, Ms. Barr. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, Ms. Gover, may we take a roll call vote, please, on um, Mr. Coon's motion? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pasture? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is six. Okay, so the motion did not pass. Thank you. Okay, so um, moving on. The next item on the agenda is the report on the multi-year improvement plans for all schools or my IPASS. And for that, I call on Dr. Scriven and Mr. Dixit. Excuse me, Madam Chair. Oh. I had not yet spoken to the reopening agenda item and had uh, put in the chat that I'd like to make my comments. I didn't see it in the chat. I thought I'd asked for any more comments, but yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I thought you were referencing Mr. Kuhn's motion. Um, so uh, emails um, that I have sent due to the limit of two minutes per board member per agenda item in the board meeting, I submitted an email, seven pages with links uh, weeks ago, and the answers were included in the board weekly update, but not attached to board docs as other reopening issues. So I would like an understanding of uh, what is the rationale of what um, issues are attached to board docs around reopening, as I know that there were other, uh, several times other questions were answered and attached to board docs. Um, I'm just gonna list a, quickly list them and any updates that would be available I would appreciate, um, a lot was covered tonight, so um, um, staff will understand, Dr. Williams will understand. So uh, cohort D or other assistance for staff with BCPS students that need supervision, especially with um, students only being in class two days until they get expanded. Um, also uh, increased instruction, as uh, Dr. Zarshan said about um, with students, especially now with the CDC guidance of three feet, um, how is it going with CDC guidance for accommodations for teachers and staff with COVID concerns uh, for in-person to be provided uh, the opportunity to telework or virtual instruc instruction? What is the progress? Um, also a corollary to that, which is new, if teachers need to quarantine due to possible exposure, but they're not ill, can they teach virtually from home? Uh, we've discussed increase of uh, in-person instruction, um, but there is still, um, you know, a, a, more understanding needed. Uh, the hybrid instruction model, right now it's concurrent and teachers are doing a fabulous job. It's a lot of work. Um, so I'm curious about the opportunity for local schoolhouse autonomy of that, of evolving and continuous improvement based on student learning needs. Also vaccination update. Uh, the media has reported BCPS has a low percentage of our staff uh, vaccinated, but in working personally at the vaccine clinics and seeing thousands of educators come through, I think we're further along in what is the update. Um, okay. The carriage fund so that is addressed. Okay. Receipt of PPE, um, and also, if I if I could, Madam Chair, one of our speakers this evening, Principal Kyria Joseph, had great suggestions about the families that mm -hmm. are not involved in virtual instruction. So I really would like to understand more about that, especially since in looking at the BCPS news releases, mm -hmm. there are no press releases about the reopening, the success, okay. I mean, it, it, it's really, um, but, my mind needs more. All right, thank you for that. And I'm sure um, you said those questions were emailed and um, staff will respond to those. So I would like um, to hear, I would, under, I would we like must to, move, we, we do have to move on though, because we have the My iPass and they've been waiting and we're an hour behind. And a lot of parents just, are going to want to hear about this study. So we want to be respectful of everyone's time. So you said you emailed the questions and they responded to you, and they were also, you said, in the weekly updates. And my question to mm -hmm. Dr. Williams, which I did get asked early on, which is, what is the rationale for including them in board docs? Okay, can we you email that to, to Kathleen directly so that we can move on I, with I'd our like agenda item? Because, because 
it, that's something that you can that can be shared in our weekly updates. But it's now 1021, and we have a very important presentation. So. Um, with all due respect for all of us, I think that we should move on so that we can have this very important um, presentation. So the next item on the agenda is the report on the multi-year improvement plan for all schools, or my IPASS. And for that, I call on Dr. Scriven and Mr. Dixit. Yes, good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, uh, members of the board. Uh, Mr. Dixit is on to frame uh, what this my past uh, presentation uh, is grounded in, as we prepare ourselves to receive information with respect to uh, phase two. So, Mr. Dixon, uh, please you, move Madam. forward. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. So, good evening, Chair, uh, Ms. Scott, Vice Chair, Ms. Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. As Dr. Scriven indicated. I'll just give you a little bit of context of what we are doing tonight. As the board will recall, Baltimore County Public Schools and Baltimore County, we are collaborating in the development of a multi-year improvement plan for all schools. Back in September, September 29, 2020, uh, we presented, or, or the Canon Design presented to the board, the phase one recommendation for high schools. Before that, updates on the progress of the plans were presented in the meetings of March 10th, 2020 and August 11th, 2020. Then another report was provided to board on October 13th, 2020, and that also included responses to dozens and dozens of questions that we received from board members. In addition to that, Canon Design has been conducting several interactive sessions um, with uh, different focus groups. For phase two, which is what you are going to hear tonight, additional, fo fo additional focus groups have been created um, um, with the help from Baltimore County. And we do want to uh, thank the county executive for providing funding for the additional focus groups to increase our community outreach effort. These focus groups are in the form of focus group summit and stakeholder advisory committee. So tonight we have the senior vice president of Canon Design, Mr. Paul Mills, and his associate, Dr. David Lever here, to make the presentation for elementary schools and middle schools. And this time around, we'll have another presentation sometimes in June, July period to complete the final part of the My iPass. So with that, I'm going to pass this to Mr. Paul Mills, Senior Vice President of Canon Design. Paul, can you hear me? Absolutely. So the screen is yours. Okay, let me double check, make sure my screen sharing is working on Teams here. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. Sorry, I thought I had my screens all set up. Here we go. All right, good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, members of the the board and Dr. Williams really appreciate the privilege to work with the Baltimore County Public Schools school system and leadership, um, stakeholders, students, and families. We'll give you an update as Pete was um, was introducing to phase two of the My Pass, um, and it'll seem very similar in form and content to what we presented to you on the high schools back in the fall, uh, with a subtle difference with the luxury of time to be able to actually um, perform the sort of outreach and engagement with stakeholders as part of the process. Uh, we are presenting to you the assessment findings first, and these findings and data are being used with the focus groups, with the stakeholder committees, and with the community at large to formulate um, the, the overall plan at the end. 
So I'm going to reintroduce myself. It's been a few months. Um, Paul Mills with Canon Design. I do nothing but this type of strategic planning work with school systems around the country. I'm passionate about public education, have my kids in public education, and um, have dedicated my career to working with large, um, complex school systems around the country, um, similar to Baltimore County Public Schools. I'll allow David to introduce himself quickly as well. Well, good evening, members of the board. Um, I'm David Lever. I'm delighted to be working again with Baltimore County Public Schools from a very different perspective. I worked with them from 2003 to 2016 in my role as executive director of the public school construction program. Uh, since then, I've been engaged with Baltimore County Public Schools to a number of separate property projects, but I'm very happy that I'm working with Canon Design on this extremely meaningful, very important project. And we hope that we can really deliver to you important results that will help to shape the capital program for years to come. Thank you, David. So the agenda tonight um, that we'll, we'll get through as quickly as we can to allow you to have plenty of time for questions. A quick reset on the overview of the my pass, um, particularly for those who might be tuning in for the first time and aren't as familiar with the project. Uh, we will speak to the assessment findings in two different ways. One about the benchmarking, looking at the three pillar studies and those benchmarking metrics and scores and rankings um, that result from them. We'll also um, look at the findings in terms of the dollars and cents that are related to the facility assessments that are out there. Unlike the high school presentation where everything was squished into one because of the time frame to make initial recommendations relative to the ongoing CIP um, back last fall. Um, the recommendations for middle schools, elementary schools, plus the bookmarked topics um, that were mutually exclusive scenarios that need to be vetted through the community um, will be presented later as Pete was suggesting. So the multi-year improvement plan for all schools really is just what the title implies. It's a, it's a capital improvement program that's long range in planning scale. Um, but as the, the all schools notion of the title, it really speaks to equity. It speaks to planning with an, a notion that is data driven, that it's based on common values and based on the voice of students, families and community of Baltimore County in a way that achieves equity for all students. A very primary aspect of this as well is looking at opportunities to maximize the state funding. So not all, um, we're not limited just to the county's generosity to take care of capital projects. So we're looking for um, opportunities to maximize that funding and to find low cost, no cost sorts of solutions where available and relevant to the educational program. The, the facility assessment study rests on three pillars as we're referring to them of analysis and study. They are, um, and we'll get into more detail in a moment, the educational adequacy and equity assessment, facility condition assessment, and the capacity utilization study. All of this has been done with overt um, engagement with internal and external stakeholders um, for the schools. And um, we're really proud of the, the design of the work we've done in phase two that has a very overt program with representative cross-sectional committees representing all areas of Baltimore County to look into participate in the design process to come up with alternatives and options that will be vetted through the community at large before making final recommendations. Our role as consultants in this um, we're really here to be the impartial, unbiased professionals that do this sort of work around the country and nationwide. We're facilitating this process. We have concluded all the technical work with our team of engineers and architects that have gone through um, your schools from fence line to fence line, from foundation up to rooftop, to really look at the health and um, uh, the designs of the schools and how they fit into these three pillars. One note about um, being impartial and unbiased. Um, that it's just that no one within Baltimore County Public Schools, the community, county government, 
no one anywhere has influenced our recommendations. These are our professional um, recommendations and opinions that we put forward. And while tonight we're not talking about recommendations, I want to share with you that all of the facilities data are objectively observed, measured, and surveyed um, with consistent professional methodology. The progress kind of reset where we were. We used the same timeline last time to show where we were in the process, but we're presenting to you during phase two the assessment findings. Um, that's on the heel of heels of the work we did for the high schools um, that concluded last um, fall. We've continued forward with the study of all your buildings, presenting your findings, and then what's important in this process is it's not let's design the best solutions out there, present them to the community, and see what they think. It's really about including and engaging the community in the process in a way that um, representational committees can actually participate in that work and vet that work, annotate that work before it gets presented to anyone and everyone in this community to look at and vet um, the various options that are put forward. It's not necessarily a, here's your solution, hope you like it. It's really about there's different mutually exclusive pathways to achieve the goals here. And these are the, the different ways, whether it's option one, two, or three. And we can take measures through polling systems and outreach into communities to confirm objectively where the levels of support or lack thereof might exist for different options that are out there. All this work will conclude early summer and we'll come back to you and present the, the full recommendations of the plan for all schools. The final report, after generations of working with you and finalizing all the actual documentation and such, will run concurrent with your P CIP that um, gets started. Um, very important part of this, I hinted at it earlier, is that there are community forums and they are virtual by, by nature of the pandemic that we're living in. But we had two of them so far, one in January to kick things off, one in February to get a pulse on um, decision-making criteria. Um, we did initiate a second community survey during that time that was open a week um, with results that will be pending for you shortly. So jumping into the assessment findings that we have, uh, first aspect being benchmarking. Some of this will be a reminder for you, but for the benefit of others who are turning in for the first time, the three pillars um, study really is, is three separate studies about the buildings themselves. Educational adequacy and equity is about the building and how it equitably supports the program and supports wellness and safety, security, et cetera. It's not about the culture at the school. It's not about the, the people, the professionals working, serving the students. It's really about those buildings. Uh, the second one, facility condition, is the name of the plan. It's about the physical health of the buildings. That's where the architects and engineers went all through the buildings to come up with a structured industry standard approach to measure the, the um, physical health of the buildings. And capacity utilization speaks to how full the building is based on a consistent rubric that's um, consistent with state policy for measuring and um, uh, judging needs for capital improvements. All three of these pillars are based on a consistent, consistent notion of data um, that drives a force ranking of benchmarking, comparative, um, looking at schools in a way that we can tell which ones have a higher degree of need versus others while they might have different sorts of needs. But this sort of weighted rubric is such that the greater the needs, the higher the priority. So the first pillar, educational adequacy and equity, I'm really stressing on the, the term equity here. We worked very closely with Dr. Williams' team um, to define what equity means for Baltimore County Public Schools. And what we've really got down loud and clear is the notion that equity isn't about equality. You've seen these sorts of images before, but for those who might not be familiar with it, on the left-hand side, we've got equality, which really focuses on giving an equal support everywhere, whether that's an educational program or the sorts of um, equipment and technology that's in a building or down to the facilities. This standards-based approach is really common in the industry I work in to come up with a nice, easy, common yardstick, measure all schools, and move on the way believing that you've achieved equality. 
Well, what we're, we've done here with Baltimore County Public Schools and it's work I'm very proud of and the team has spent a lot of time working on is the notion of how do we design this in a way that actually achieves equity, which isn't about having the sameness for supports, but rather sameness for the outcomes. So as the image here would imply, there's a variable degree of supports that bring um, the, the actual people that inhabit the buildings up to a point where they are supported on an equitable and par level. For facilities, what, this, what does this mean? Well, in the equality space, we're talking about standards, ed specs, minimum standards that either apply for the state, as we've looked at here, as well as where we know that Baltimore County um, wants facilities that exceed those. Well, that common baseline is where we start with this. It's very objective and data-driven. The second half, where it's a little more flexible, depending on the relative needs of the student populations that are served by the facilities, has a variable component to it, but it still has the rigor of data behind it. What are we talking about? You know, we're talking about vulnerable populations that are out there. We're talking about homeless students. We're talking about students that are English learners, um, special education students, and students that um, deal with poverty. Uh, being able to translate the data that drives and measures the students that are inhabiting the school to a facility need and whether it exists or not is where we can judge and benchmark those relative needs. This is something that's very special and unique um, that I've perceived in my career having done this in a lot of places. And it's something I believe that will become a, um, a, a template that school systems around the country can use. In addition to this notion of equity and equality that's deep into this rubric that we've developed, we've been listening. Uh, we've been working with focus groups focused on equity, condition, and capacity. We've also been working with community groups and have had open invitation um, meetings. We've had surveys, and we've been hearing um, loud and clear. There's a few messages um, about what needs to be importantly worked into this. There's three examples I want to lift up. In the 1970s, uh, many of you might have attended these, but the open plan schools, the pod schools, the ones where there's not walls in between all the classrooms, where the design intent is for teachers to be able to collaborate and, and do intercurricular um, planning and delivery of instruction, team teaching and the sort. And to do the sorts of things we design schools to do now with very interactive project-based learning, et cetera. The only problem is back in the 70s, they didn't account for acoustics. And those sorts of schools are very difficult to operate within without an extreme level of discipline on the part of the students to cooperate with your dedicated instructors that are doing their darndest to make sure they're learning. Um, we've accommodated those open plan schools of which you have several that are still in use today in 2021. And we have adjusted factors within the adequacy um, rubric to signal that those are inequitable conditions and they ought to be addressed. Second, um, in looking at the high school initial recommendations, we put forward that um, a leaning towards renovations and additions as a cure for um, condition capacity and adequacy for the facilities. And a, res a common response we heard was that we've done additions. We know what additions are, we don't want additions. Well, peeling back the onion and learning more about the narrative is that in the 1990s, there was an expansion program to keep up with growth that was happening in your communities. And there were a bunch of modular cl uh, classroom buildings that were deployed. Uh, many of these were built to t in today's standards would be considered your learning, um, your learning cottages, I love the term, I had to look it up. Um, but your, your temporary portable buildings that are really set there as a stopgap until you can get permanent construction. Well, these modulars were several of these built together in a way that was um, tried to mimic a permanent construction setup, but really didn't have the quality of true stick built um, custom construction. And they're inequitable and they're getting old at this point. Um, to accommodate that, we've looked at that in terms of both the adequacy and equity, and you'll hear about it again when we talk about the capacity. And third, I mentioned it earlier and talked about it, but the um, equity metrics for the vulnerable populations that are being served here really is hard baked in. All of this was from feedback that we've gotten from stakeholders across the county, and we're proud to have accommodated it in the metrics.
So you might recall this image from before. It's kind of a, you know, a hierarchical look at the scoring rubric that we've set up. And for you teachers out there, very familiar with how you look at student um, improvement and performance metrics and grades and things like that. Doing it with a consistent weighted rubric, well, that's the same sort of methodology we've used here to measure the educational adequacy and equity of the buildings. So there's six um, categories here. You can see them on the inner wheel here. You know, wellness, relationships, collaboration, educational program, operational utility, safety and security, technology and furniture, and on the outer wheel are what we call the KPIs with 29 of them that are subcategories, if you will, that help measure out the relative um, strengths and weaknesses of the facilities. Those measures centered around equity and uh, the types of um, facility accommodations for vulnerable populations, et cetera, are woven into multiple KPIs and categories. Um, it's intentional. We hear loud and clear that equity is not a box to be checked. Equity is something that's pervasive and interwoven into all facets of an operation. And so we've taken that to heart and made sure that that's accommodated where it's appropriate within the framework. Those um, open plan schools that I mentioned earlier, those affect also multiple categories and KPIs. As an example, safety and security, you don't have the walls around, so it's a lot less uh, or a lot more difficult to secure. It also affects uh, relationships and collaboration, um, as well as the operational utility of the building. So that there's a few different instances where the scores get drawn down in those facilities that are inequitable like that. So this whole framework and the breakdown and the weights that were set up were developed in close consultation and engagement with a, um, a very diverse and representative focus group that was tasked with helping us define what equity means and how do we use that in a way to measure your buildings. Um, this is common with work that I do with other school systems around the country, but this was very tailored to Baltimore County and was done with representatives from um, both Baltimore County Public Schools, as well as Baltimore County government, as well as community liaisons, um, students involved in the process as well. We're really proud of the work we've done here. And one real important note about it, this whole framework and all the weights were designed without naming a single school. What I mean by that is this was based on values. What's important, what's a priority for all students? That's how this thing was designed. It was done in a way without any sort of reference to how it might affect any sort of downstream metrics that would come forward from it. So how does it look for middle schools? Just like with high schools, we've, we've shown here the, the scores. It's on a 100-point scale, and it's in ascending order in terms of um, the how well and sound and adequate the building is, meaning that towards the top of the list, rank number one, two, three, four, et cetera, the lower number here, that represents more need. These are the needier schools that within that framework of six um, categories and the 29 KPIs, these are the ones that are in worse condition versus the ones towards the bottom. We've annotated here also the regions, the planning areas, um, for those that are familiar, but working kind of from um, going around the clock, the southwest, northwest, central, northeast, southeast. I've annotated them there because I know that some folks might not know the entire county and all the school names, but this helps you at least geolocate a little bit here. And we'll get into some maps in just a little bit as well. But I'm going to give you a couple minutes just to soak in maybe some of the um, schools you might have particular personal interest in or look at the top of the list, bottom of the list, but we're going to move on to the elementary schools. So here, fitting them all on one page was a bit of a trick. Just we have 107 of them. Um, to accommodate here, but here's the same sort of ranking with uh, the scores for elementary schools. So the top five or so here that really are kind of color coded here to kind of show degrees of, of the scale um, that's consistent across all the, the different categories and metrics is that Summit Park, Chatsworth, Johnny Cake, Red House Run, Scott Ranch, Pine Grove, and on down the way are the elementary schools that have the greater need relative to wellness, educational program, safety, security, all those different aspects that we spoke about. 
we did a lot of QA, QC on this. I don't have an image to share with you, but if you could imagine taking a timeline on the X axis and the scores on the Y axis, and then you plot all the dots on there for each school, each score, meaning the newer ones at the right, the older ones at the left, and draw a trend line through those dots. There's always an upward sloping um, trend line on this. There might be a couple outliers, but in general, the newer the building, the more educationally adequate and equitable it is. And that just bears out logical sense here that the newer buildings are ones built to today's standards versus the ones built back in the 60s, 50s, and earlier in the process. Um, we did as part of QAQC to find any sort of um, any sort of quality data quality issues, but also it's just to validate. Yeah, this is a this is a very valid metric to use um, relative to your schools. I'll give you another couple minutes. I know there's a lot on the list. All right, moving on to the next um, pillar. Oh, um, we do have backup reports that show. Um, all the different me measures that fly beneath those KPI subcategories as well, um, and those um, as previously were made available. On facility condition, our next rubric, um, it's really about an industry standard engineered approach to doing facility condition assessments. It yields an index, a FCI, a facility condition index, which is a common way in the industry that looks at the costs of all the repairs required uh, divided into the cost of replacing. So you get a general sense of quote unquote, what percent broken a building is. And it's an industry standard that we do. It is broken down by the cost and weighted by the cost, I should say. So that if you look at kind of the major systems and then you know subsystems from that and all the detailed parts, those are weighted not by consensus and working through um, live polling exercises, small group work, and things like we did with educational adequacy and equity. This is driven by industry standards by cost. So those more expensive items are weighted heavier versus the lower cost items. This was validated by a similar focus group as well, focused um, on facility conditions. What are the findings here? So you can kind of see through the veiled middle ground there where educational adequacy had a different ranking from what we have on condition. Now there is some correlation on a couple of them. You know, some of the better ones are also in better educational adequacy condition, but not always the case. And you can see that there's relative needs that are different among all of your middle schools, just like among all your schools. Similarly to the other um, pillar here, the higher up on the list means the greater need. I'll give you just a moment there. There's nothing in the red category, which we're happy to see um, in the middle schools. So a lot of parity. And that's driven by the fact that you don't have many, rel I think there might the newest middle school is from the early 2000s time frame. Um, whereas with high schools and middle schools, you have a lot more newer examples that can be brought to bear. So there's a little more flat curve as far as the, the outcome of these. So here's the elementary schools. Um, on condition. Now, elementary schools, you do have several newer facilities that wind up in the green category towards the end, as well as um, some older ones that wind up towards the bottom end on the others. Many of these are um, in that red category there, are among the ones you have on, on the um, Schools for Our Future program of legacy projects that are um, very near-term implementation. Again, I'll give you just a, a few more seconds here to take this in. Okay, moving on to the third pillar, capacity utilization, and a similar map to the one we had with the high schools. So the picture tells uh, you know, a thousand words, right? Uh, it really kind of drills down and you can focus in on what's what's going on here. Perry Hall is your only quote unquote red category um, school of middle schools across the county. And that's defined as ones that are over 115% utilized. That utilization um, to, to refresher is the projected enrollment, how many students divided into the state rated capacity or how many seats, if you will. So if a building can, given its educational program and the way the spaces are being used, can accommodate a thousand students and you have 
800 students actually attending, you're at 80% utilization. If you're at um, 1,200 students, you're at 120% utilization. Those sorts of metrics help us determine how full the building is projected to be. So the figures we're using for the numerator of that figure is the seven-year enrollment projection. And these are provided by Baltimore County Public Schools staff, and they work with consultants that do this sort of work. And as professionals, we did a peer review look at the methodologies that they use and the sound industry standard approaches to doing um, enrollment projections. In some of the metrics, I, uh, and one, one thing I want to signal on this, their baseline year for this was pre-COVID. That's very intentional. While we do have information from this current school year, it is very much an outlier case, and we don't want to have that last year fling off and extrapolate some strange models that really are outlier cases due to the pandemic. So we've responsibly made sure that we're flinging off the diving board, if you will, for the enrollment projection is based on tried and true enrollment projections based on non-pandemic scenarios. So the state rated capacity is an official recognized number by the state, and there's actually a process to get that number changed um, as part of it. Um, in the middle schools, just like with the high schools, we've made accommodations in the enrollment projections based on the um, BCPS's plans to bring some of the English for Speakers of Other Languages programs that are regionalized right now back into the home high schools and middle schools. That means that fewer road miles for those students that want to avail themselves to those programs, those families that want to avail themselves to those programs, which is great. Um, these reforms and improvements that are happening within the planning horizon of the seven year period, we have accommodated and made adjustments in them so that we expect those students who are currently going perhaps to a regional center in the future would be going to the one back home. So we made those plans so we're not looking in a rear view mirror when we're doing our planning, we're actually looking forward. Oh, a couple other points about the map here. Um, you'll see in the details of it, the notion of areas that have the background use the same color scale that we're talking about here. So if you're looking at the Northeast, you're in this orange bracket, which means 100 and or 100 to 114% utilized, means you're full and beyond a bit. In the white, it's between 85 and 99. I do know from looking at the details, there's a fine line difference between right on the cusp, the high end of the white range here in central, or in the very low end range for northeast. So we're kind of in a parity space, so the map can be a little misleading, but I want to signal that we're, we're fine tuned on all the details. But in those areas where you're full, and you have specific schools that are projected to be over enrolled, such as like a Perry Hall. That means that adjusting boundaries and finding some low cost, no cost solutions, operational solutions to the challenge um, are difficult unless you're doing something virtual. There's no neighboring capacity around those schools to relieve it because on average, they're full throughout the area. So the findings, the benchmark scores, and let me explain how the scores are computed. It's pretty easy. If you're 100% capacity utilization or less, meaning that you've got plenty of space designed for the building, the way it's being used to accommodate your projected enrollment, you got a perfect 100 score. For every percentage point above 100% utilized, so if you're 101, your score would be 99. If you're 110, your score would be 90. If you're 113, you'd be an 87. You can kind of see that where we're starting to get into yellow, meaning that you're overutilized, you're over 100%. And the degrees to which are really um, with the numbers. So Perry Hall, the one in the red for middle schools, is projected to be at 79 as the capacity score. So we're using everything on that 100-point scale. However, what that means is, at the end of the day, it's projected to be 121% utilized. You can see the force ranking there. Okay, and then there's details behind it. Um, I think our webmasters are still loading this, our dashboard onto our website, but all the details behind this on capacity utilization, just like with the high schools are made available for middle schools and elementary schools as well. And the way to kind of see how this works, the notion left-hand side here, we're looking at that percent utilization. 
And over here is the delta between or the difference between the um, project enrollment and the capacity. So if you're short, you're a negative number. If you have surplus, then it's um, a positive number. So you can kind of see that Perry Hall, that was the one that was in the red category, it is projected to be short by 337 seats, which equates to that 121% that I was mentioning. And then you could look at the blended averages by region up at the top. So you can see where currently in central and northeast today, or you know, our baseline year last year, we had surplus throughout the system. Maybe with some schools a little over or some under, but on average, they were there was a surplus. However, over the planning horizon of seven years, that essentially gets um, uh, gobbled up by growth. All right, elementary schools. A lot more dots, dots on the page, a lot more red dots, as you might notice here on there. We have orange regions that cover just about the entire county, meaning you're full. There's not much um, surplus capacity to be had throughout the system. And there's probably um, some construction required, capital improvements required to accommodate the growth at the elementary, just like we had with the high schools. Again, this is a seven-year projection. It's a state-rated capacity. And one thing I wanted to signal here, remember those 1990s modulars we're talking about, those you know, portables on steroids or <laughs> however you want to refer to them. These are, um, by today's standards, you would never call them permanent capacity, but right, wrong, or indifferent, they're recognized by the state and the state-rated capacity as permanent capacity. What does that mean? That means that we're presuming that that's a permanent construction that's going to be there for the long haul. Well, we know those buildings are, at this point, you know, getting well beyond 20 years of age and have served their useful life for the type of construction that they are. And we have made adjustments in the capacity for long-range planning purposes to presume those buildings are not here for the long haul. And what does that do? Those buildings that have those types of modulars, that adequacy score, or excuse me, the capacity score, puts them up towards the top of the list. And I'll show the numbers and you can start to see a couple of them. So here's all of the elementary schools by capacity. And a couple of them right at the top. A zero capacity score, which I explained the math earlier, that means you're at 200 or more percent projected utilization at the end of the seven-year planning horizon. Well, that's by nature that Red House Run, that we know is on the um, Schools for Our Future program list, um, and Deep Creek Elementary School have those modular buildings on them. When you discount those off of it, the percent utilization goes up tremendously. So they get lifted up in terms of their inequitable situation, and um, any such school like that is also accommodated in that way as well. So a lot more red, as we saw on the map. You can see the rankings of them where they are as listed here. And the ones that are um, have surplus capacity or plenty of capacity, 100% or less, are the ones shown in green. I'll give you just a few more seconds to take this in. It's a lot of names. All right, so just like with the middle schools and the previous high schools, the dashboard that has all the details behind it um, that you can peruse. So now we have the three pillars. Now they're different measures, measuring different aspects of school operation, and they're all very important. And just like with the high schools, we've um, blended these together with a weighted scoring system. And it wasn't just arbitrary. It was based on surveyed information from 22,000 people in the county. And to remind you, just as it was with high schools, we use the same weighting proportion where educational adequacy and equity is slightly higher than one third um, at 35%, facility conditions slightly lower, and capacity utilization is right on par with a third. So it's roughly a third each, but we wanted to not just make it arbitrary, but rather we wanted to lift up what's a priority to your stakeholders. And we've accommodated that into the, the scoring system. So how's this gonna be used? Three different ways. It's really centered on the notion of equity. It's to help inform what kind of facility options are the right ones for the schools, whether it's doing additions, doing renovations, replacing the school, relieving it with a separate school, et cetera, that could in, gets informed by this data, as well as the sort of renovation project scope that could come out. 
you know, in the facility condition, we're talking about repairing stuff, right? Taking care of those roofs that are getting old, taking care of um, air conditioning, boilers, et cetera. Renovations in this educational adequacy and equity are a little more dramatic. These are items that bring the sorts of layouts of the uh, floor plans and the designs of the schools in a way that really mimics what we would do when we're building a new facility. So the, the accommodation in the cost that you're going to see in a moment um, account for not just doing uh, a little facelift. We're talking about transformative outcomes for schools, and we've done this around the country, and we have a lot of examples where you might even think it was new construction if you were to visit it. But at the end of the day, oh, and, and thirdly, sequencing the projects. Um, coming up with a way with so many different schools, 170 facilities that have a very wide range of different needs, having a, a consistent system that's based on the voice and consistent values um, applied in an objective and mathematical way is the way we can help inform what the sequencing of these CIP projects ought to be. All of it centered around the notion that the greater the need exists, the higher the priority. So here's the aggregate need for the middle schools, blending the three in weighted by the 35, 32, and 33 um, percent weights on the different scores. We come up with the aggregate need score on the high schools. You can see the ones with the reds are float towards the top, the ones with the greens more towards the bottom, but you can see the relative um, rank and aggregate need scores for middle schools on the screen now. Give you a couple more seconds. Elementary schools, same. I don't have the three pillars on here. I just couldn't fit all the stuff on one page. And um, forgive me, I wanted to get all on one page so we can see it all at once. But um, you can see in red here, Red House Run, Deep Creek, Summit Park, um, towards the top, and your on average, your newer facilities towards the back. And I'll give you another moment to take these in. Okay, so that is the benchmarking aspects of the work, just like we do with high schools. So we have a very consistent way of um, comparing the relative needs of facilities. So what's all this stuff going to cost? So I'm going to share with you um, are the assessment findings. Now, this is assessment findings. This is not a recommendations. And I can tell you, working with school systems in many states and all over the country, no one can afford to do all of their priorities. So assessment findings are just a measure of all the ocean, the universe of need that's out there, the recommendations and plan, and how we systematically in a prioritized and equitable way um, recommend a road path or um, a roadmap to achieve those is a different animal. So I'm going to show you the big gory numbers that we've got here. This includes all schools. You might remember from the high schools, the tally was around $1.2 billion with a B. Um, and this includes that among those numbers. So right now we're talking about a range because we're not concluded with the process. We have engagement to do with stakeholders and design thinking to do with them to come up with those different um, options that could be used to remedy the, the um, conditions that are out there. That's why there's a bit of a range. So just like before, this is a seven year forecast of your condition needs. It's a seven year forecast of where the enrollment projections are going. And it's today's um, measure of educational adequacy and equity um, based on the rubric that we set forward. It, this number includes schools for our future. You'll remember the class we called legacy projects. Um, from the previous one. We have several of those in middle schools and elementary schools under the title of Schools for Our Future. And those that have already commenced um, are considered legacy projects, but we have accommodated those and understand um, the cost implications of those. It also includes the potential for relief schools. And that gets into this little wedge here where we had capacity could be addressed in multiple ways. And for us to just early on in the assessment phase tell you what the answer is, we just don't know. We have to go through the rigor of process and do the vetting through your stakeholders to come up with the most relevant solutions. You might remember from high schools, we looked at scenarios where um, in the Northeast, 
you have a lot of short, um, a shortfall of capacity that needs to be addressed. And we looked at, there's one scenario where you do additions on your existing high schools, just grow them a bit bigger. We showed you benchmarking of the sizes, what they might be versus the rest of the state of Maryland. But another way to resolve that would be a relief high school that would relieve all of them, change the boundaries around, change your feeder patterns, et cetera. And um, that's a different way. Now those have different price tags with them. Similarly, in our preliminary looks at middle schools and elementary schools, there are those same sort of um, mutually exclusive outcomes and we wanna go through the rigors of process to make sure we're addressing the needs that are responsive to your community. This does not include land procurement just like before. It's just at this very early preliminary stage, um, we just don't know what, where the land ought to be and how much it might cost, et cetera, so we did not include it. Now that could be accommodated with other public agency swaps, those sorts of things. It could be straight procurement, et cetera, but at the time of implementation, that needs to be accommodated and that's not in these numbers. Um, just like before, it doesn't include unfunded replacement projects um, that would forestall other projects down the road. So that's a, you know, we're talking $4 billion. That's a, a big number to take on. As I mentioned before, there's not a school district in the land that can address all of their needs, all priorities, et cetera. But we want to start to look at what this roadmap might look like. And this might be some hints as in terms, just like we did with the high schools, what recommendations might be ahead of us. Well, your, your current rate of funding, which is 140 million a year, presuming that construction costs escalate over time and the budgets would proportionally go up, it would take 27 to 29 years to get that range of 3.7 to $4.1 billion accommodated, which many generations of students going through your ranks um, to get through nearly 30 years of time frame. There's definitely a call for how we prioritize things. The last time we, we talked about the prospect of the Built to Learn Act, and we looked at you know, very early um, forecasting what that might be. And we, we believe that for the high school scenario, uh, we were talking about um, it reducing the time frame to about 15 years. So we used another 15 year sort of thing and it was right around the same range. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention earlier, the 1.2 billion we reported for high schools was for one third of your portfolio. So you're roughly in that same range extrapolated for the balance of the two thirds with your elementary middle schools and centers and those sorts of facilities as well. So what would it take to get to a 15 year cycle? Well, it required just doing the math, it requires another 1.6 to $2 billion um, above your current funding levels. Where that comes from um, is definitely something we want to work closely with staff on and come up with the best strategies for it. That equates to about 107 to 133 million a year. So it's approaching what you're spending now um, on the higher end of, of additional funding required for capital projects in your schools. So Built to Learn Act does look um, very positive. And based on our current read of the legislation, the formulas are such that there's um, $462 million that's earmarked for Baltimore County Public Schools, which is a great deal of money. Now, the size of these circles is proportional. If that is your $4.1 billion there, that's 140 that you do every year. It would take 29 of these to fit in here. Well, there's your Built to Learn Act, which looks tiny compared to this, but actually it is significant. You know, it's over 10% of the projects. Um, it is a one-time program that we understand, and we're don't know all the details about the cash flowing, et cetera, so we're not sure, but we're working closely with, with county and um, school system leadership to make sure we're being responsible with recommendations. But it does require the county also put in additional to be able to receive that matching grant, uh, probably somewhere in the realm of 60-40 split. Um, just by way of benchmarking and comparing, 462 million, it's a lot of money. It could accomplish a lot of things. Well, just by comparing what you've got in legacy projects and the, in the planning stages that are already on the county end are accommodated, but on the state end need to be backfilled with the final construction, there's about 240 million required to complete your schools for the future, as well as the Lansdowne legacy project there. So in some regards, um, look at that money of Burke to Learn that is a huge blessing um, for Baltimore County Public Schools, but that a lot of it is already on the short end accounted for with ongoing projects. So all this speaks to the need for 
for prior to, um, we did this last time and showed you kind of the spread and it's a very similar curve that we had before. We've broken down all of these various costs among the three pillars in five tiers of priority. And it, just think of it in terms of Mav, Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs, right? Those things that help you um, stay healthy and alive are the ones down at the bottom of the pyramid. Well, those are the high priority things here. Um, we have put most of, most of that is capacity because you're at a point of um, being critical, particularly with high schools and elementary schools. One thing I want to signal here, and it's something I mentioned last time and it still bears out, um, the, the county government has been generous to keep um, the preservation of your assets sound and your staff that's charged with maintaining your buildings has their eye on the ball. This number, 14 million of priority one, tells me something. It tells me you don't have these critical needs sorts of things. 14 million sounds like a lot of money, but for a vast portfolio of 170 schools, it's nothing. What that means is you should be applauding yourselves that you've got great leadership and you've got priorities of taking care of your existing assets. What we've got to do is move on to taking care of future assets by bringing in the capacity that's needed um, critically. Now, as you start to get down deeper into the priorities, you start to see a little bit more of the facility condition costs in there. That's more routine maintenance and more of the stuff that's coming up on the horizon um, that systems that will reach the end of their useful life within the planning horizon and those adequacy and equity, which you know, these things are just in my mind, must haves for an educational facility. So when we start getting deep into, you know, priority three and stuff, that's where we're going to see a lot of those sorts of priorities. But anyway, share this with you to give you a, general sense of what we found with our three pillar study and the benchmarking associated with it. What dollars are there? We're not going to step into the recommendation. Um, so like we did with the high schools yet, because we do have process to get through, but we'll come back to you in early summer with those findings. And with that, I will conclude our presentation and maybe give you a little bit of recap of what's coming back up um, on screen here that I described earlier. With that, I'll take any questions you have. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, we do have some questions from some board members. Looks like first is Ms. Clausey. Good evening. Good evening. Previously, it was requested if there was an analysis done on projections, and it seems that there still has not been an analysis of the actual, actual accuracy of projections. Is that fair to say? Um, the, what we were charged to do was to peer review the methodologies used, and we found that the methodologies were of sound, consistent industry standard that we would do if we were doing the work ourselves. So I understand what you did do, but so there was not an analysis of the accuracy of projections over the last five years or even further back. Um, I would defer to um, Dixit or anyone else at Baltimore County Public Schools. So uh, part of the task that Canon had was to look at our methodology and ensure us that it meets industry standards. And that's what they have done. You mentioned the survey responses. What was the time frame of the survey responses? So we've had two surveys. One was in July of 2020. And there was one in the February timeframe with community forum number two. And in December of, uh, December 22nd of 20, there was a contract approved by the Board of Education, um, JBO 70221 contract funding authority, $10 million related to contracted services for on-call uh, special projects, architectural design. Um, what is the relationship between your uh, being awarded that and the MyI pass? You were awarded with other uh, firms for on-call minor projects, but also for special projects where no value was indicated. So those are separate solicitations that um, we applied for both. We were successful on the Maya Pass and we were pre-qualified. For work is not an awarded, we don't have a project from it, but it's a contract vehicle through which Baltimore County Public Schools um, could solicit proposals for us to compete on future work. 
So that was in conjunction or not in conjunction with my I-PASS? Separately. And then uh, maybe Pitt, Mr. Dixit could speak to special projects where no values indicated. What, what variety of projects could that represent? So what we do is when we bring those contracts to board, are really establishing a list of pre-qualified architects, civil engineers, mechanical engineers, and electrical engineers. There is no promise of any work to them. And in case of Canon Design, they have not been assigned any work. They have really, to my knowledge, have never worked with us. So that is just means that they meet the qualification to perform work for us. Should we have work? And should our team um, of engineers or architect select them for that job? And so far, they have not been selected for any job, to my knowledge. So if we are trying to correlate any of their work with any of the pre-qualified, just about every, uh, every architect or engineer that is in town that has done school work is perhaps pre-qualified. I just want to point out that I did abstain from that vote. The next question is to Dr. Williams and Madam Chair Scott. Since the board just received this presentation, um, the document was just uploaded during this meeting and it was really quite hard to read uh, that fine print. We understand trying to get all of the information together. What is the process for board members to submit questions and then receive answers that can be published? So that's why we have our weekly updates. Um, so any questions you can submit and will be shared in the weekly updates. Um, what about them being shared with the public? Um, I don't believe that's something that we've done in the past. You were talking about loading them up in board docs or something. Uh, there was a website with my iPass. Maybe Mr. Um, Mills can speak to that. What documents are there? There was a disruption with the ransom attack, of course, but... Well, I'm sorry, were you speaking in regards to board docs or to my iPass website? Because I thought you were talking about uploading questions and answers to board docs. I'm looking to understand the process where board members' questions um, can be submitted and answered and then shared with the public. So my question is, would it be uh, in board docs or would it be in the my iPass website? Do we have an answer for that? So what we had done last time, and I'll have to um, uh, have a conversation with Dr. Scriven and the superintendent, but what we had done last time that answered those questions and posted it on website at that time. Since then, we have a new website, which is still being populated, um, but uh, I do not see any issue sharing those responses with the board member immediately as we get it. Okay. We have been extremely transparent. Mm -hmm. uh, on this, this, when we started this program, one of the set of instructions we had from superintendent and the county executive is to be totally transparent. Uh, I do not recall of any project that we have done where there has been this level of transparency. So there is nothing to hide here. We'll share it with the board members and uh, we welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm next. Out of it looks time, like so it is Ms. the rest of my questions in. Thank no. you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Next is Mr. McMillian. Great. Thanks, Mr. Mills. Uh, Spears Point Middle School is in a very unique situation. Out of 175 schools in Baltimore County, they share a building with Spears Point High School. In fact, they share the auditorium the library, the cafeteria, the gymnasium, the locker rooms, the athletic fields, and the parking lots. When you did your study, how did you incorporate that uniqueness into your formulas? Thank you. Thanks for your question, um, Board Member McMillian. Um, in the initial high school recommendations, we did lift up in there's a class of projects that we that would require stakeholder outreach, due diligence on land and those sorts of things. We highlighted that inequity that exists at Spiros Point High School and Middle School campus. And um, that's something that's, you know, I have, a, I have a daughter who very recently was in the middle school ages and um, you know, as a father of that with 
commingling with the older boys, you know, you know the sorts of narratives that could really go through an emotional situation. But you know, and not even kidding aside, it's something that's very um, personal and something we're very focused on. As we're going through the planning process, um, absolutely, we're looking for an outcome that brings the Spirit Point community in alignment equitably with the rest of the county in terms of their grade configurations. That probably means finding a new home for the middle school. The school right now, the high school is crowded. The middle school is crowded, and we need to find a new place. Most likely, the middle school will, will um, have a new home as part of that process. Um, or you'd have to continue to grow that campus with more additions on that tight campus and still continue to, to look in there. We're looking at adjacent elementary sites. Potentially, we know there's a big industrial area that has um, future growth that might happen into it. So we're looking at opportunities to alleviate that inequitable situation. We are very aware. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Next is Ms. Mack. Um, I have a two quick questions. Um, when we show an aggregate score, um, and then there a number of schools have the same aggregate score, how do we determine ranking? So the, there are decimals beneath the, I think they're just rounded at the whole number for presentation purposes, but the ranking is is based on, um, you know, coming up with that numerical order. Okay, and then the other question, and I apologize, but the slides went by pretty quickly and the print was very small. I did not see Watershed Charter School included. Um, I need to go back and see if we've assessed that building. I can't remember if that was on our list or not. We know it's a unique situation there. Um, I did. I, I failed to mention to you also, we did assess all of the special center programs, the Crossroads um, and others that are not a traditional elementary, middle school, high school. We did not include them in the benchmarking because their programs are so unique. They require a unique uh, approach to measuring and accommodating them in the plan. Those are part of the Maya Pass and will be accommodated as part of it. It's just, you know, while the facility condition assessment is consistent with there, but doing any sort of program comparison and equity, it's apples and oranges, and we didn't want to confuse the narrative about it, so we left them off of this report. Okay, but you will have some type of report that does include schools like that? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. That's all the only questions I have. Thank you, Board Member Mack. Thank you. Next is um, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, Mr. Mills, going back to Sparrow's point, this is a special case. And um, since we have, luckily, um, the presentation from phase one, we can see that Sparrow's point is over capacity in the red and projected to be at 136% over capacity in 26, in 2026. And <clears throat> when we look at the middle school at Sparrow's Point, the overcapacity rating is, it's, I don't believe it's in the red as, as much as, as the high school is. If I'm looking at it, it says 109% in 2026. And my concern here is this is, it's a special case because we have to look at the whole facility, right? And, and we have to come to some conclusion here. And by treating the middle school and the high school in very separate ways, I don't want to lose the special case that this high school slash middle school actually is. Yeah. Um, remember, Kuhn, great question. And let me see if I can address where I think you're, you're heading. Um, we are we're looking at this as a system. And when we have a community like that that has – these schools that are interdependent on each other, we, we design solutions for it that are comprehensive in nature to address both of those programs at the same time. And the reason there's differentiated numbers is different parts of the building are assigned to different schools, so you'll see different um, uh, metrics associated with each of them. And however, take to heart, and we're very aware of that unique circumstance. And um, we've already, in our initial recommendations, are um, I've signaled that with um, some of that one class of projects that require future vetting, and that's part of the road forward as we finish the Maya Pass. Thank you. Um, uh, the next thing I want to draw your attention to is I'm jumping between 
um, slide 16 and slide 19. So basically, I'm looking at the uh, capacity, capacity utilization for middle schools and for elementary schools. Mm -hmm. And what I'm seeing in elementary schools are, are lots of yellows and reds. And then when we get to the feeder pattern into middle schools, I'm only seeing one red, yellows in all sorts of places, and, and whites and blues. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if we need to take a closer look at the feeder patterns to understand what's happening because we go from very over capacity to very full, but not screaming over capacity. I don't, I don't quite know how to explain that. And, and I'm concerned that we're missing something in the translation from elementary school to middle school. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of indicators that could explain some of that. Um, first of all, the, the buildings themselves um, dictate what the capacity is based on that state rated process for determining how the buildings use, et cetera. And it's the buildings that have the capacity. The enrollment projections are what they are. And um, uh, sometimes there are family decisions that are made at that middle school level to look at alternatives, whether it's in private school sector, charters, et cetera, maybe neighboring districts. Um, sometimes those decisions happen at those cusps of great points, but really I don't, I think it's less that than the former where it's just the circumstances of where you have capacity in your schools. But Thank we do you for look that. At feeder alignment and the boundaries as part of validating um, how this can be aligned for the long haul. We're working very closely with Melissa Appler and the research department that handles those processes with the community and their hand in glove working with us on um, the mechanics of the plan. Thank you. Next is Ms. Rowe. Ms. Rowe? Yes, yeah, so you mentioned. Um in passing that you have detailed reports on each facility. And I noticed that when we got the high school uh, report, we didn't see these charts with these um, rankings. Where can we get that information? So I believe some of this has succumbed to the ransomware attack here, but we've furnished copies of the reports that were made available to you through PTIC's office and um, through the channels that were described earlier. Okay, so there there are rankings like this for high schools that we can see? Uh, yes. Okay, and so Mr. Dixit will get that to us? So if I remember in the high school presentation, you had a similar list that was part of the presentation and it did have rankings attached to that. Okay, but so what about each of the, uh, Mr. Mills mentioned that each facility had its own report. Is that available? That report is available. It is not on the website because of the detailed nature of that report. Mr. But Dixon, some, some you know how fond I am of gigantic binders. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, that report can be provided um, to anyone. Yes, I would like that, please. Thank you. Yeah. That's all I have. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, Mr. Mills. Good evening. You had mentioned um, legacy projects, and I'm aware of um, Lansdowne being identified as a legacy high school project. I apologize if I missed it, but could you review the legacy elementary and middle school projects that have been identified? Um, they're on basically everything north of Lansdowne on the CIP list. I don't have it at the ready on screen right at the moment. But these are ones that have been um, given the name, the schools for our future program. Correct. Which includes, there's two new schools in the Northeast, I think an elementary and school. Um, to accommodate growth, and there are several um, uh, replacement schools and a couple of additions, I want to say. I'm sorry, I just don't have them right at the top of my memory. So let, 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 me, let me help you, Paul. Uh, uh, all of the schools that have been approved by the board in the county's capital program and shown as fully funded, they are part of the legacy project. 
and I'll quickly name some of them. I may miss one or two, but Northeast Area Elementary School at Ridge Road, Red House Run, Bedford and Summit Park, and Northeast Area Middle School, and Pine Grove and Deer Park Elementary School. Pine Grove Middle and Deer Park Elementary School and Scott's Branch Elementary School. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. That's oh. great to hear because um, as you mentioned, Mr. Mills, Perry Home Middle is the only middle school in the red in terms of um, utilization. And they have been waiting for relief way too long. So that new Northeast Area Middle School is critical to provide the relief that that school needs. So I'm pleased to hear that that is um, part of your recommendations to continue and that it has been flagged as a legacy project to move forward. And that's all I had. Thank you both. Absolutely. Thank you. Are there additional questions from board members? Okay. Um, my uh, question is, um, well, one, again, thank you for the presentation. I, feel, I thought this was um, very informative and um, and I look forward to um, seeing all of the recommendations and, and everything like that. So, um, and this was, did you say this was a projection for how far out? I think I missed that. A uh, seven year planning horizon. It's, it synchronizes with what the state expects when they look at capital requests. Mm -hmm. Seven years, okay, great. Yep. All right, well, great. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I couldn't see your name or address you by name. Oh, that's all right, Makita Scott. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, um, and with that, I would like to make a motion to postpone items J through L to the April 6th board meeting. Um, um, if there was a second for that. Second. 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 Thank you. Ms. Um, Gover, could we take a roll call vote, please? Could I what? Oh, yes, I made a motion that we postpone items J through L to the April 6th board meeting. So it was motion was made by me and it was seconded, I believe, by Ms. Pastor. Sure. I think Ms. Mack. a lot of Ms. Lot Mack. Of OK, <laughs> yes. So because it is quite late. Um, so and I would like everybody to get home safely. That's what I'm worried about. Yes, Ms. Causey. Thank you. Uh, I had a question and a comment related to your motion. Okay. I'm sorry, was your motion seconded? I didn't want to interrupt that. Yeah, it was seconded by yes. Ms. Mack, and we were about to vote. because. Okay, thank you. So uh, my question is, um, will that remove item K, which is just information, but there is some um, important information there related to the compass, our pathway to excellence. Yes, it would remove that. We can um, discuss it at the April 6th meeting. What I'm worried about is the lateness and um, people getting home safely I understand. Um, I after just, quite some time. So I understand. I just would prefer that it be left in board docs so that people can review it. It is. Okay, thank you. Thank and my you. Um, other question is I was going to request um, to add policy 4005 to the policy review committee agenda tomorrow that, because it relates to tutoring. But the agenda, I believe that has already been published. I understand. And in reviewing the Saturday engagement and the additional information presented <clears throat> about our very much needed tutoring programs that are being um, um, ramped okay. up even more uh, than typically, um, there is a policy that prevents teachers from tutoring their current Ms. students. Ms. Causey, we're trying to adjourn. I, so if we could take I, a vote, please. It's, it's I, I late and so it's where we... I of you as the chair of policy review, okay. if you could... But I'm concerned about the welfare of our staff it. and all of our board members. And um, it is quite late and we've discussed a lot and I would like to make sure everyone gets home safely. So I hear your requests and I will... Um, do my best to accommodate your request, but we're trying to adjourn, and I think it's appropriate now for us to take a vote. So thank you for that. Um, um, okay, Madam Chair. Ms. Gover, I, if we I, could go ahead and take a vote, please. Madam Chair, my understanding is that there can be discussion before votes. There is, and we've had the discussion. I, I, I didn't finish with my time. I, I apologize, but... Okay, please go ahead with, please go ahead with your time. This is, this is very... 
um, very discouraging and most unbecoming of a board member, I feel, because um, it's not taking into the consideration um, our public, our viewing audience, and other board members. But if it's that important for you to continue on, then please go ahead with the rest of your time. Um, I disagree with your presentation of that. I, you acknowledged me, and I had two minutes. So please go a, ahead. It's an issue of importance, and I would like um, if uh, Dr. Williams could also make a note of policy 4005. Thank you. Ms. Gover, may we take a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Mr. Offerman? Ms. Pastor? Yes. Uh, I'm not asking any questions now. <laughs> We're taking a vote, Mr. Offerman? Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Most definitely so. Dr. Hecker? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So the last item um, on the agenda is announcements. The board's next hybrid meeting will be held Tuesday, April 6, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us, and the meeting is now adjourned. Good night.